I would like to thank a couple of people involved in making this event possible. Uh, Paul um, McKinney, uh, Dave Hansen, David Lorbueso, and Davo Gianni all really um, helped us. Uh, it was the first time that we'd done this, actually. I co-organized co this event with Ying Huang from Intel and Pasha Tatashin from um, 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 Microsoft. It's a little bit of a stutter. Uh, anyway, also I want to remind everybody that this is an interactive event and to not be shy with your questions and ideas. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Tim Chen from Intel, who will be talking about scheduler task accounting for C-groups. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Chen. I'm from uh, Intel's uh, Open Source uh, Technology Center. So uh, a, a few years ago, like I think it was three years ago, um, we have a benchmark team uh, call that does uh, uh, database benchmarks, like uh, TBCCs, uh, and and then they, they they came to me and and complains that on the latest uh, kernels that when they start testing on four socket Haswells, and all of a sudden they see uh, eight eight percent uh, degradations uh, in performance that compares to the numbers that they have seen before. Um, and so, so we start looking at like what happens, like why, why are the new kernels like that happens. So it turns out that um, this becomes a default option, the config scat auto groups. And um, so they, even though they are not uh, purposely using C group, but with the uh, scat auto groups, so automatically say the, uh, the, the workloads now gets into a C groups, yeah. So we found that if we turn off like this, this uh, two config, like, or, or just disable the scat auto groups, like, they get back uh, the, um, the throughput loss. And so four sockets, they lose at uh, 8%, and eight socket is even worse, like, they lose at like, 19% of the per performance. And we did, uh, <coughs> Uh, we did a recent check on, on this uh, particular workload. That's like a four socket, um, 28 cores per socket at Kennelake systems. And uh, things get a little worse that compares to uh, the four socket task. Well, now it's become a uh, 12% uh, degradation. So uh, where, where does this, um, what causes this uh, performance degradation when C groups uh, get used? Uh, so we look at the profiles. So one, <coughs> one thing jumps out is this function uh, called uh, update block averages. And uh, if you disable C groups, this particular uh, function that disappears from, from the profile. And it's, it's, it's really uh, high, so it's 5% top of everything, say. So, um, yeah. And so what, so yeah, so here's a snapshot of this, uh, this function. So up, um, and you'll notice that there's a for loop that uh, goes through say, all the active C groups. But actually, we don't have a whole lot of C groups that are running say, for, for, for these benchmark teams that are just using probably just one, one uh, C groups, one active C group say, for, for them. So this for loop probably just go, go through once. Um, and then, but this functions, uh, so if C, so there's a, uh, there's a each check that sees say like, whether it's on, on this particular CPU, there's a, there's a load change. And if there's a load change, then you, you go and call this function update task group load average. And the, the, the task groups uh, is, uh, every C, C group is a task group, so, so you will actually update. So what happens is this task group load average is a global uh, counters. And then you have, like for this uh, benchmark team, say, they, they have like um, about 12, 1,200 threads like, all running say, on, on the CPU, so like, all the CPUs are uh, very active, they're constantly doing this uh, up, uh, update and constantly hitting uh, this function. So, 
so this uh, uh, task group load average counter get updated very frequently. And because it's, uh, it's a global counter, so the, the update is done using an atomic, um, atomic add operation. So, and it's a four socket system, so you have like the, um, the cache line bounce, bouncing all over it. Um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty expensive. Yeah, for, for this benchmark. <coughs> so he, here's, uh, here's a problem, yeah. And uh, because that for, for this benchmark team, that the, the workloads, that uh, <coughs> the task threads, um, it has a lot of uh, blocking that because they need to interact with other stuff. So they block and wake up, block, wake up. So there are a lot of calls to um, idle load balance that, that triggers this update block averages and uh, this happens that very often for them. And I think the problem will get worse because uh, remember that for loop that we, we see just now, it's just for, you actually loop through that all, the, all the C groups that on, on this uh, particular uh, CPU, all the active right, C group for. So if you have like more C group hierarchies, then you might be banging on <laughs> more um, counters and you might be updating more counters. So I think the, the problem will, will get worse like, if you have s several layers of C group hierarchies. But as it, as, as it is, like, even with like, one uh, C group level, say, the, the problem is uh, pretty bad already. Um, so um, I don't have a very good solution, but this is something that is, is a very na naive thing that, that I thought about, uh, but I think Peter will have a very hard time to accept. I gave you a question about this, so did right. you try that? Uh, we, we, yeah, we, we try, a, we, we try that. Um, yeah so, yeah, so I gave you a patch two years ago that splits it into per yeah. node uh, stuff. Um, I never heard back from that, and then I forgot about it, of course. Yeah. I, I gave it to the um, uh, TBCC team. So, I, I, yeah, I, so this, is, this is something that um, they, I think is, they have to, uh, they have to try, try out. I, I think I, we, we did it once, and um, so you don't have to aggregate it back into a global one. You can right. just keep it split out, and then whenever you need to value, just sum all four or five or however many things you have. Um, and you want to uh, have them on separate gas lines, of course. But I, I think the patch did that. I, I can't remember. Like I said, it's two years ago. Yeah. So so we we'll have to. Uh, get back and and do that do the do the work yeah there yeah um, so this is this is something that uh, maybe uh, I think will work so so actually P Peter is like maybe it's a it's a question so you um, you think that um, with a note like something like a note counter is like this. Um, is acceptable for, is, is this something acceptable for upstream? Sure, if it works. Isn't this going to depend on the number of tasks and how fast they're switching, the hotness of the atomic increment? So this is just sort of delaying the problem, right? Um, if you do the atomic operations inside of a level three cache domain, it's relatively cheap. When you cross no domains, they get really expensive. Oh, okay, so it's the cache migration, not the content, not, okay. The contention will reduce I mean, because you, you're staying inside a cache. Yeah, I mean, okay. you, you can still see the, the, the cost increase even inside of a node, but once you do the, uh, no domain boundary cross it, it really I goes see. up. Just 
I guess with the uh, new CPUs coming out, the patch needs to be updated to be per LLC and not per node? Yeah, you want it per cache domain. I, I guess the other questions I, I have is like, will it be useful to, um, there might be others kind of similar as uh, global counters um, use a lot like, uh, inside the kernel. So, so will it be useful to have like a node, um, per node kind of a, a counter, similar to our per CPU say, infrastructure? Yeah. So that might, be a little less um, uh, memory uh, costly than, than the per, uh, per CPU counter. <coughs> then it wouldn't work. Yeah, you need this. Yeah. I was just asking, you know, how important is it that we keep track of the load average? Peter says it's important. I, th I think you need that on uh, the, uh, the load balancing. Yeah. So each time you actually try to see, uh, uh, each time you try to load balance, you actually need to update all this data. Yeah. Before you you can actually load balance. I was also curious, uh, have other people hit this uh, um, issues? Uh, yeah. We've, we've seen performance issues with the uh, C groups <laughs> enforcement in the scheduler as well. But <coughs> the systems that I started looking at are single node, so it's obviously not this uh, same thing that you're seeing. We see about a three, four percent performance regression by using uh, the CPU controller. So you actually have a, you see the, the degradation even in a single node? Yeah, it's just not, probably <coughs> not coming from uh, the same function that you see most of your degradation come, but simply from enqueuing and dequeuing hierarchically and uh, things <coughs> like that. Yeah, that's just a lot of pointer chasing that you otherwise don't have. So it might not help even it's like even if we uh, convert it to a uh, uh, per node counter, uh, like at, at least like for rigs. Uh, um, well, yeah. the per node counting or per, per LLC uh, would probably solve part of the problem you're seeing, but probably not everything. <coughs> Um, in that diagram, you have basically had an array of per node um, counter, right? Uh, does th they have to be in separate cache line, is that right? It will be like for, it will be separate counters for each node. So no, no, I mean. Uh, they, uh, they will have to be separate cache line, correct? Yeah, yeah. and that will greatly expand the uh, size of the task Yeah, book. yeah that's, that's a downside of yeah. um, doing this. So if you pursue this solution or revisit Peter's patch, you might consider trying to abstract this into some kind of a distributed counter, distributed aggregator, so it could be used in other cases as well, because this is a common problem. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's, that's the, the thought I had. Like maybe we should have like a per node counter. Yeah. Well, right, but I'm saying turn that into um, a reusable object, a reusable interface that other uh, clients could use. Uh, it's, it's like Rick said, you need it per L3, not per node. And they're L3, mostly right. the same for our chips, but other people have different ideas there.
no more questions. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Pasha Tatashin. Uh, in the last year, I've done uh, a number of um, boot improvements, uh, fixes, uh, improved the page initialization, uh, CPU startup, um, also did some early time stamps um, projects, and uh, basically improved the uh, kernel boot time in various places, uh, improved the initialization of system hash tables. Uh, but uh, today I want to talk about uh, something else. It's more like uh, an academic question. And um, so basically uh, the question is uh, how to update operating system uh, seamlessly. So if something runs on the operating system, uh, it's almost not noticeable to that uh, VM instance or container or some process that the operating system underneath it uh, has been updated. Uh, so uh, in a cloud, okay. so in, uh, in a cloud it's a common uh, situation where we have uh, one server and it's uh, shared um, into many uh, VMs, and um, it's uh, it's the problem how to update that uh, server without affecting the VMs. So this is just uh, one case. As I said, it's uh, the problem is also related to uh, not only to the VMs. Um, and we need to update uh, hosts regu regularly, of course, because uh, if we want uh, them to be uh, stable and secure. And, uh, and on, the, on the other hand, uh, in the cloud, we basically cannot afford the downtime, as um, our customers expect, 99.9% like of the uptime. Um, so the question, how, how can we do that? And, uh, the, there are some ways to address this problem, right? So the existing uh, methods include hot patching. So the hot patching uh, works to update the kernel. We can um, fix some security issues uh, with the hot patching. 
but it doesn't work for everything. I mean, we can update the text, we cannot really update the data that well. And um, uh, it also even the text um, gets permanently slower compared to uh, before the hot patching. Uh, so, uh, and the, with the hot patching, it's hard to introduce a new feature. It's like it's possible to fix some like, uh, like uh, uh, some small security problem, but not even like a, a big one, like for example, like what Meltdown was there. Uh, the way uh, VMworks had to be redone. So the, for that, we needed to do like a, a, a full reboot, full update. So the second uh, possible solution is of course live migration, but that requires extra hardware, right? We have um, one server and then we can live migrate what runs on that server to another uh, machine and update that server. Um, and uh, for that, if, if we are talking about the VMs, um, the VMs have to be configured to run on the smallest common denominator between uh, the two servers in terms of the, uh, the hardware and the hypervisor interface. So the VMs can be slower compared to if they were configured to run on a native uh, hardware and native hypervisor. Uh, so it's not an ideal solution either. And of course there are some uh, mitigations for this problem. So we can um, k-exec, skip the firmware, just uh, load the new kernel, jump to it, boot it. Uh, and uh, we can keep some of the uh, application state in memory and reattach to it later. So we could keep VM state in memory or we could uh, keep some other state in memory. Uh, that is not as trivial though um, because um, when we are attaching the state, we have to consider that like the state was that was kept in the uh, OS before the rebooting. So, but uh, some of the application state can be um, kept in memory. So, uh, the two solutions uh, that I thought of uh, from uh, for this uh, problem is are this. So the first solution is uh, using the co cooperative multi-OSing uh, and um, it's basically when we have uh, one kernel running and handling all the job while the other one is uh, simultaneously booting on the same machine and we give slice of time to that other one to keep booting and even to bring up its uh, user space so we do uh, k executing from one kernel to another cooperatively. So um, we suspend, as an example, so the, um, the green one is the uh, current cur kernel that is running and uh, that, is, uh, that handles the VMs. So it would uh, suspend the VMs, jump to the new kernel, k executing. Uh, the new kernel would boot for a short time, then jump back, resume VM, run VM, suspend, and, and so on. The problem with this approach, uh, there are actually very many problems with this approach. It's not very scalable and it's slow because the k executing between two kernels would be slow. We would have to capture CPUs. We would have to QS the devices, resume the devices, uh, suspending, resuming VMs every time. It's, um, it's not really seamless. I mean, it might work on the smaller hardware. It might work on some specialized hardware where Q, uh, device QSing is cheap. Uh, but overall, it's uh, not really not really scalable and a good solution. Um, and even academically, I don't think it's something that um, th th that would work for this case. Cooperative multi-OSing might still work for some other things, but um, probably not to solve this problem. So the second solution is um, a VM to, be to bare metal. It's basically, we have, um, one host OS that uh, runs on a bare metal and uh, it has several VMs running like uh, on, on this uh, v uh, VM manager OS. And uh, we need to update this uh, host OS. So we start a new host OS inside the VM, but the new uh, VM gets a memory layout the same as the like bare metal, so the memory list is exactly the same. 
in addition to that, the CPUs are exactly the same. So all the instructions that are normally emulated are, n are either not emulated, or if they have to be emulated, like CPU edit, it's always emulated. Uh, it traps to the underlying host OS, and the host OS returns the true value to the new um, host OS that is in a running in a, uh, currently in a VM. So we boot the new host OS, we live migrate uh, the VM instances into it, and uh, after we've done all of that, uh, the old host OS would uh, key exec into the, uh, the VM uh, the, the updated in, into the new updated host OS that is still running in the VM, and um, in, in, we would have like a new entry point where we would start um, converting the extended page tables uh, to to become actually uh, real uh, real physical pages. So uh, we could either copy them to the right places, which is slower, but more reliable. Or we could fix the page tables within the OS, which I think is more fraudulent. I don't like this idea. And I think that if we do not live migrate the VMs prior to this jump from uh, VM to bare metal, uh, there is not that much copying needs to be done. And we can actually uh, attach to the running VMs after this switch. So, um, and again, there are some problems with this approach too. Uh, the main ones is actually how to handle the devices. Um, so we would need, the old uh, uh, hostess would need to QS and resume into the new one, but at least it needs to be uh, done once. So this is the second uh, solution for uh, a seamless update of operating system. And, um, I wanted to ask if there are any other solutions or if um, you have comments on like uh, these two approaches and uh, maybe have some more thoughts, ideas and so. Any thoughts? Um, if we reduce the time of booting the VM to minimum, does it still be, is, is, is a big issue? What is the time that you see in the, in the booting of VMs that it's generating so much issues? I, I have seen sometimes of less than 200 milliseconds sometimes. Uh, less than 200 milliseconds to do what? To the boot the, the VM at some point. No, that's uh, booting VM is fast. I'm talking about uh, updating the hypervisor, so like uh, the actual OS that uh, manages the virtual machines. Mm. So it's not actually updating the virtual machine. Yes, uh, it's possible to boot VM in uh, under a second, and uh, it's uh, even a bare metal. You can boot it uh, relatively fast if uh, kernel is optimized. Um, well and uh, uh, but um, but still if you update the full stack like uh, from the kernel to system to services uh, it uh, takes time especially on uh, larger machines which um, uh, host many VMs on top of them thanks how are you proposing to create a virtual machine on the host that has the whole memory of the host while the other virtual machines are still using this memory? Uh, yes, that's a, uh, that's a good question. So um, when we boot that uh, host uh, OS inside the VM, uh, it sees all the memory, it's not using it. So uh, w once we start uh, live migrating the VMs inside that one, those uh, VMs, uh, th that memory that is occupied by those VMs is actually released from the actual machine and added inside this, uh, uh, is allocated inside the new host uh, OS v uh, VM. This needs a lot of work from user space to work because currently you cannot create a virtual machine without actually having the resources. You cannot create the instance. 
to start with? Uh, I'm pretty sure when uh, you start a, a VM, it doesn't allocate all the memory right away. No, it, it doesn't allocate it, but the user space requires it. For example, for uh, with KVM. You, you, if you, you don't have the free resources... Well, I mean, um, if you're not touching the resources, it's not going to uh, know that those resources are missing. And you can actually uh, like start a VM with even more memory than the machine has. Okay. Uh, just curious, have any of these methods been tried, prototyped, or it's just real? Yes, that's, uh, that's what actually I plan to do, to start prototyping and see if uh, this is actually doable. That's uh, something I'm eager to try, to, uh, to try to go from VM into bare metal. I'm very interested, like okay. just okay. doing a very simple KMU emulation, so the host OS is actually going to be in KMU, then start something uh, inside the uh, KMU, and then go into the <laughs> okay, thanks. Hi. Uh, when Hi. Uh, can you move to the second solution you suggested? Yes. You said migrate the running VMs inside the new host. So you mean while the new virtual machine is running with the new code, you want to migrate the other VMs into it? Yeah, so that's uh, one of the solutions to migrate the other VMs inside the new host OS while uh, it's still running as a VM, so it will be like a nested virtualization. Uh, yeah, is it possible? Because I, I know that... Yes, nested virtualization is fully supported by Intel right now, and um, actually I think uh, KVM supports it. And I, I know we've tried uh, once to, you to do a nested virtualization. For example, we... Uh, we're using a Mellanox card, and uh, we couldn't do it. There are no kernel patches to support it. At least mm. there weren't when we tried it. So uh, it's it, it, it should be, it should be supported now, as far as I know. But uh, I I haven't tried it myself. But as far as I've uh, researched, it, sh it should work. And uh, uh, Intel documents the nested virtu uh, virtualization quite extensively in its, uh, in its uh, documentation. It will be interesting to hear mm -hmm. that it happened. Okay. At KVM Forum, there were several several talks about doing just that, so I think it's at least possible at this point. I don't know mm -hmm. the exact details. What do you do about things like SRIOV? When you're trying to initialize the, the VFs and, and push those up. Yes, so um, th this is an excellent, excellent question. And um, so I was first thinking to handle the. Okay, so for the prototyping, the one that I'm talking about in the QMU, I'm uh, going to try uh, without the devices at all, just the um, memory and CPU, no like uh, external devices. Uh, but um, uh, as I say it somewhere that the, uh, the handling devices need to be designed well, but um, uh, the new host OS, I think we'll start handling the physical functions um, while it's still running in, in the VM. So we would, uh, the old host OS would um, uh, stop the devices and give the handling to the uh, new OS that is still running in the VM. And then when it's um, become like when it will become the bare metal, uh, it will just continue using them as um, like uh, as physical devices. And uh, oh, Daniel, it's your password. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Thank you.
Okay, I think I'm all wired up here. So, uh, hi folks, thanks for coming. I'm Steve Sestere, and I'm gonna talk about some work I've been doing on improving CPU utilization um, with an enhancement to the task scheduler. So, I um, only have a few slides here, but let me just tell you what's coming so you know, you know what to wait for and when to ask questions. Hello, they're welcome anytime. So, first I'm gonna very briefly talk about the existing load balancing mechanisms in the scheduler. Then I'm gonna describe the new method that I've introduced into one of those places. Uh, present some performance data, talk a little bit about some NUMA issues, uh, and then talk about future directions. So moving right into it. Um, so uh, first I should mention I've been working on the CFS task area, although the ideas could be extended to others. So in CFS load balancing, um, at a high level there are a few places where we do this. Uh, number one, a task wakes up and the scheduler has to find a place to run it, and ideally we like to find an idle <coughs> core or CPU. And so we have to do a little push, um, and right now the code uh, searches in the last level cache set of CPUs, you know, hoping for an idle core or CPU. Um, and the search is limited depending on how busy the system is. So the scheduler tracks uh, the recent cost of these searches, um, and also tracks the average idle time recently. Uh, both of those decay over time. Um, and at some point uh, during the search for this idle CPU, if the cost exceeds the uh, average idle, it stops looking um, and, and just defaults to placing the task where it woke up. Um, and I've, I've noted the uh, code paths that do some of these things, since I'm going to be tapping into them later. Uh, so the next place we do some balancing is when a CPU goes idle. So it's run the last runnable task on its run queue. Um, and so we have to pull a runnable task from some other CPU, some you know, um, deserving waiting task. So this also does a search, and it searches the scheduling domains, starting from the smallest, most local domain up to the broadest, so up the hierarchy. Um, and this is also a bounded search. Uh, again, we, uh, the scheduler remembers the cost of searching each domain recently, um, and again compares that to average idle. So as it looks first in the core domain, and then the uh, socket domain, and then multi-socket domains, um, at each of those steps it says, well, have I spent too much time searching already? If so, stop searching. Um, and this can be expensive, particularly in large systems. Um, at those higher level domains, you might be looking at hundreds of CPUs. It's a linear search. And so this cost can get up into the uh, you know, tens or even hundreds of microseconds across all these domains that are searched. Um, uh, let's see, okay, and then lastly, um, periodically, there's an attempt to globally smooth out the load, um, looking at all the run queues and trying to push tests around to balance things. Um, and that's a proactive attempt at keeping the CPUs fed, so you know, making sure they all have multiple ready-to-run tasks and, and they don't go idle and we don't have to do these searches. Um, okay, so what I've done is I've extended this second area uh, where the CPU goes idle. So uh, in my new code, um, when the CPU goes idle, uh, I search for CPUs in the last level cache domain, um, often L3 now, uh, nowadays. Uh, the search is not limited, and the goal here is to find the first CPU you run across that has more than one runnable job. Um, and I, elsewhere in this talk, I call it an overloaded CPU. That term is also used in the current code for, for real time. Um, and you want to steal one task. You don't really care what task you get. Uh, the goal is to find some work to do as quickly as possible. And in my measurements, this can be done pretty quickly. It's uh, typically one or two microseconds to do this. And as a result, um, it's cheap enough that you can afford to do this search every time the CPU goes idle. So you don't give up. Um, and essentially, if there is something runnable out there in your LLC, we're going to find it and we're going to run it. Um, Okay, so that's the, uh, the overloaded stealing. So uh, yeah, a few more bits here. Um, so to, uh, to speed up the search and make it more scalable, I added an auxiliary data structure here. I keep a second bitmap um, per last level cache of the overloaded CPUs. So whenever a task goes on or off CPU, um, if you cross that threshold of one runnable job on the CPU, I either set or clear the bit. Um, in this mask, and so we have this nice compact representation for the LLC of all the potential candidate CPUs that have an extra task I might be able to steal. 
And then, of course, when we look at it, there are other criteria that can be applied. It's possible that uh, um, it's possible that the task is not allowed to run on this idle CPU. So sometimes that bitmap is uh, the bitmap is necessary but not sufficient. Um, another detail here, though, is that that uh, the setting and clearing these bits is atomic. Uh, there's no lock protecting that, but that can be a bottleneck. Um, you know, bitmaps are very dense at one bit per CPU. Um, on a, you know, an architecture with a 64-byte cache line, you could have 512 CPUs all mapping to the same cache line, and of course you can't do atomics at higher rates than that. That will not scale either. And so I added a new primitive uh, called the sparse mask, uh, model after the CPU mask primitive that's already in the kernel. Um, and in the sparse mask, I only use a few uh, active bits, um, a few uh, uh, relevant bits per cache line. Um, that's actually a compile time. Well, no, it's a it's a runtime creation time constant. Uh, I use eight for my work. So eight bits per 64 bytes are used in this bitmap. The others are ignored. So I've written all the uh, the set traversal and manipulation primitives to to skip those unused bytes. Um, and this scales very nicely. Um, I've measured the overhead of set, of the atomics that set and clear these bits um, at very high. Uh, uh, at very high context switch rates, and it's negligible. You, you don't, there's no contention measured. Um, so let's see, yeah, so I mentioned the, the API is patterned after CPU mask, uh, which is used pretty um, extensively in the scheduler code. Um, and therefore, it's a familiar API. It's pretty easy to take any place that currently uses CPU mask and drop in the sparse mask. So it's a familiar abstraction for the programmer. Um, and just a few other aspects of this. So the way this is integrated in the current code, um, currently when the CPU goes idle uh, and it says finding the next task to run, it calls idle balance. Um, in, in my patch, I still do that. I first call idle balance. Uh, idle balance, as I mentioned before, searches all the scheduling domains. So it gives, it gives the code a chance to find um, tasks to run uh, outside of the last level cache, you know, other NUMA nodes and maybe pull it over and run it. And, and that is important because my stealing code only looks within the last level cache. But if idle balance returns no candidate, perhaps because it, you know, exited early, thought the search was going to be more expensive, then I call this new stealing code to look for a candidate within the last level cache. Um, so I chose the last level cache as a scope for a few reasons. Uh, one is I wanted to avoid NUMA issues because they get tricky, although we see, I'll see, you'll see later on that it was entirely successful. Um, but second, is very efficient. So you've got this set of CPUs maintaining uh, uh, run queues and associated metadata, locks, et cetera. Um, and by looking within that last level cache, much of that metadata stays within the same LLC and it's pretty cheap and fast to access. And so the, uh, the search time is lower. Um, and actually, uh, one more refinement here. I, I said that the, the search here looks over all the CPUs in the last level cache. It does, but it does it in two steps. So first I look within uh, the CPUs within the, uh, the core, the same core as the idle CPU, try to maximize the, the cache locality there. And if there are no candidates within that very close range, then I go out to the broader LLC. So, uh, and I've got a reference here to this uh, work in progress patch out there. Uh, any questions before I move on to some performance data? All right, so uh, the results I'm getting. Um, I've tested a number of workloads and gotten some you know, nice performance improvements, um, but it uh, turns out Hackbench is very illustrative for this, so I'm using it. Uh, so on this test, I compared the baseline kernel to a kernel with a stealing enhancement um, using Hackbench and running it on a, uh, a one socket um, Xeon system, uh, 10 cores, two strands each, so 20 CPUs total. Uh, so Hackbench here is run uh, with a series uh, of different numbers of groups. Now each group in Hackbench represents 40 tasks. So in each row uh, here, first row represents a run of 40 tasks, the next is 80, 120, and so on. So we've got the baseline results in the top, the new kernel on the bottom. Um, and so what I'm showing here is some of the uh, secondary statistics that you can get out of uh, ProxSkedStat when you run this which incidentally is totally awesome now that you can compile in SCEDstat 
to the kernel um, and then enable it dynamically. It's just a huge boon to doing any development of the scheduler. So kudos to everyone who gave that to us. Um, so the data I'm showing here, um, the elapsed time in seconds in the first column, um, and then the uh, CPU utilization, the, the sum of user and uh, system time here. Um, the next column, the average time slice in milliseconds, um, not too interesting for this experiment, other than to note it's really small for Hackbench. This is a tremendously chatty workload. Um, the total number of calls to the scheduler um, uh, across the whole run, but at per CPU, so per CPU total. Uh, the number of times the CPU went idle, uh, the number of times a task woke on the CPU. And then this next last column, the, I call it the percent find time. This is the cost of the scheduler functions that do the push and pull. Uh, matchup of tasks and CPUs as a percent of total CPU time. So uh, you see in the baseline kernel, we're ranging from you know 0.3 percent to about you know 0.5, 0.6 percent, um, and, and that's very relevant, of course, because I want to show that the stealing code uh, is still efficient. And then the last column shows the number of steals per uh, CPU. In the baseline kernel, there are none; it doesn't have stealing. Um, so part of my patch adds a few extra stats to measure things like the find time, the number of steals. Um, they're really intended for developer use only, probably won't go back upstream unless there's some demand for them. But anyway, the, the, the second table um, showing the stealing code. So same columns, and if you look at the CPU utilization shown here and also plotted in the upper right, um, on our 20 CPU system running the smallest experiment, 40 tasks, where on the baseline kernel we're about 75% utilized. But it turns out that's pretty uneven. Some CPUs have more than one runnable task, and others are idle quite often. And stealing smooths that out. And so you can see as we add more and more tasks, um, whereas the baseline kernel in red on the bottom slowly converges towards 100%, the stealing kernel rapidly reaches 100% and maxes out there. And we got a corresponding uh, improvement in the elapsed time, uh, the percentage of speed up shown in the, in the lower right over there. And uh, the other stats show that indeed stealing is, is doing its job, it's helping us. So the steal column, we're actually doing a number of steals uh, per CPU uh, across the, the length of this run. But what's kind of interesting is, uh, you know, the steals are still a relatively small percentage of the overall schedule events, um, you know, 1% or so. But it ends up making a pretty big difference in the overall utilization. Um, and what that also means is the, the fine, percent find time is pretty low because they, you know, we didn't have to do many steals to make things better. Um, so the percentage uh, of CPU that we're using to do this went up by about 0.3%, maybe 0.4%. Um, but we're getting a much larger payback in the overall speed up of the workload. So this is the basic data. Any questions before I move on? We can come back if something occurs to you later. Um, how much did you record, like, how much more migration happened? How much like, what should happen? Uh, how, much, how much more the tasks migrated? I mean, oh, yeah. Like um, actual migration. Yeah. Sure. Well, this is a one-node system. So um, I allow arbitrary migration within the last level cache. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't apply, I don't try to force things to stay within the L1 or the L2. And no, I mean just how like oh, the number. But of in migrate. general, cross cross node yes. then for new. Well, there's no node, just between CPUs. I mean. Oh, between CPUs. Well, um, oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I have that data. I'm not showing it here. Um, yeah, I have to dig that up to see what the old yeah. versus new. But but essentially, you know, the, the stealing numbers would be the delta for the new number of moves. Um, okay. And uh, again, it's a pretty small percent of the overall moves. Th things move around a lot. Uh, again, particularly with Hackbunch, we've got all these senders and receivers mm -hmm. talking to each other a lot. You know, the, the wake-up code tends to bring one to the other frequently. So. Anything else? In, in the far back, we need a mic. So you oh. introduced the bit mask. So I'm wondering, since it is a sparse bit mask, and essentially while stealing, you have to find the next uh, on overloaded CPU index, right, starting from a current index. So don't you have to like scan through a lot of bytes before you get to the next one? So how efficient is that compared right. to just using a regular bit mask and trying? Right, right. Um, 
Well, so in the implementation of the spark, this sparse bit mask, the eight significant bits are all in the first word. So I can skip over the remaining seven words in the cache line. So the, well, well, again, you know, I look in the first word of a cache line, you know, looking for the first uh, eight bits. And if there's nothing there, I can skip all the way to the next word in the next cache line. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only looking at one eighth of the words now, yeah, it is true in that first word. It is true in that first word. I'm only looking at, you know, eight bits out of the 64 bits. And you could imagine a regular bit mask, they, you could squeeze them down and, and traverse more efficiently. But again, the, the, the scaling issue is the dominant factor here. You really have to avoid um, the cost of maintaining these bits in the transitions uh, on and off CPU. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, do you have any more uh, performance numbers that can show that some cases, so much migrations, like Steven said before, could downgrade the performance of, of the benchmark at the end? I mean, not the total CPU utilization, but the total time that the benchmark take to execute at the end because of many transitions or migration between the, C the, the, the process between the CPUs. Do you have more results of performance that were not only this one? I, I didn't quite get the thrust of your question. You, are you saying, do I have more results than this to show improvement? I, I, yes, I have a, a large number of results. Uh, they're in the patch series if you want to go look at them. But I've, um, I don't know, run some Java workloads, other networking workloads, um, you know, read, write, micro benchmarks, uh, you know, full scale database, Oracle TPCC. Um, and, you know, we're seeing real improvements across that whole range of benchmarks on, on single and multi-node systems. Okay, thanks. Okay, I have a question here. Um, so currently, what is, uh, what is the status of, uh, or what are the organic criteria for migration? Uh, and how does this stealing impact that specific algorithm, if there is anything? So for example, why did the CPUs decide to go to idle when there was apparently sufficient workload to be performed? Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do to maybe address that in addition mm -hmm. to this? Sure, sure. But, well, so we still have some idle transitions um, because at that moment, the search didn't find any overloaded CPUs. Now, you know, scheduling is by its nature a tremendously racy problem, right? At that instant, there might have been nothing available to steal, but then the moment you stop looking, maybe something becomes runnable and, and you know, therefore that's why we don't hit perfect 100% utilization. So follow, no. if nobody is. Um, yeah. Is it primarily uh, addressing bursty workloads or or sustained uh, high workloads? What would mm -hmm. what do you think would be most benefited out of um, this? It certainly helps a lot with the bursty workloads because the existing uh, load balance mechanisms, because of the cost, uh, balance a bit more coarsely, and so they're they're not going to move things around at a at a high frequency. Um, but again, in, in general, the stealing will benefit uh, kind of normal context rate workloads as well, um, because it's, you know, you just never have to wait to, to run another thing. You can very quickly find the next uh, runnable task. So. Okay, I so. did, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh no. No, sorry. So, so I would mentioning for your schemes, uh, the idle balance, the overhead goes, like, uh, goes down quite a bit. Uh, it, it does. That, that, that's right. So, so the measured average cost of idle balance, uh, sure, it, 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 it shrinks. Um, and, and as a result, which can actually be a good thing, because uh, it gives idle balance future chances to run more often and maybe pull things across Numa nodes. So. Do you have like uh, um, quantifications of like how much time that you spend in idle balance before and uh, after? Say, um, um, not broken out, but idle balance is included in the, uh, the percent fine column cost there. So not a dramatic difference, right? At least at the gross level of, you know, the billions of cycles of uh, CPU time I have per second. Just one last question, sorry. Yes. Do you have uh, data for any real workloads apart from the synthetic benchmarks? Yes, uh, as I was mentioning before, probably the, the most complex thing we've run is the Oracle database um, on OLTP workloads on uh, a large multi-node system. And 
across a variety of low levels there. I'm trying to remember the data, but we're seeing good, uh, you know, middle, maybe up to 8% or so improvements in throughput. Um, and we'll get better on that. that. That setup was somewhat uh, restricted. So, yeah. um, so yeah. you, you are bypassing the current idle balance. When the, ta when the CPU become idle, we, mm -hmm. are, we currently have a way to pick, to pull some tasks. Mm -hmm. You are creating a new one. Do you know if the, this better um, result are coming from the fact that you are skipping the test with the average idle, or it's only because you have a simple policy to pull one waiting task? I mean, have you tried, for example, to, to remove this uh, constraint of as soon as we are above the average idle, we, we stop the current idle balance? Uh, yes, I, I have experimented with that. And, you know, the, the current policies and thresholds are very well tuned for, for a large search. You know, you, you start messing with them and telling them to do more work and change the thresholds, and, uh, and the search cost goes way up and the throughput goes way down. So, so yeah, with, I, I played a lot with the parameters of the existing framework and didn't make any progress in improving performance until we went to this alternate method. Uh, you mentioned that currently a new runnable task can be scheduled on a di separate different CPU, right? Uh, what on the separate different CPU? I'm sorry? A new runnable task can be scheduled on a different, not, not current CPU, right? It, oh, it we, we, well, that's right. So, so the, yeah, I mean, the runnable task at some point in the past was queued in some CPU. It's got a, you know, queue length greater than one. And the CPU goes idle and he gets to steal it over. No, I mean, when, when new task becomes runnable, yeah. current code can decide it to run it on a different CPU right away. Yes, right? Uh, yeah, so, so I, that's the push side. I, I don't modify the push side But at if all. we have this efficient stealing, do we still need to schedule task on a different CPU or just always schedule on the current and let the stealing? Well, you could do that. I mean, both push and pull are balancing mechanisms. You could be lazy on the push side and let stealing pull the thing over. Yes. Um, however, that, you know, that there's some costs around that. You do have to lock a couple of run queues to move things around. It, it, it's better to make a more intelligent and efficient decision in both directions. You get better performance overall. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it, as you're saying, it would work, but it, wouldn't, it would be a little less uh, efficient only doing it from the pull side. Okay. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that this stealing doesn't steal across new nodes. Right. It, it could. So, that, that, that's a future extension. And I, I'll talk about that in a minute, actually. So but. how does the balancing across Numa nodes happen? Uh, idle balance is still called, and it still traverses all the scheduling domains, the top most of which is a, a Numa domain okay. cross, uh, cross node. OK, so it happens if your new stealing code doesn't find anything. Uh, right. The reverse. I call the old, the old balance code first. And if that doesn't find a candidate, uh -huh. I call my new one. Have you tried to do it in the other way? Like first try um, your first uh, Yes, I have. I, I, I have tried in the other way. Um, I, didn't, I didn't see much difference in the cases I did a deep dive on. Um, you know, possibly if I looked at more workloads, we'd see one. But, mm -hmm. So I didn't see any compelling reason to do it uh, uh, the new way first versus the old. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in future directions, I'll talk about ways to uh, uh, combine what idle balance does and what stealing does, and, and maybe only have one mechanism. Last question. Yeah. Uh, you said that you pack the eight bits in the first byte of the, of the mass. That, that's right. That's right. Have you tried to uh, give each CPU one byte so that you have one I byte? I did. Um, I did try that. Um, I tried one so. byte per CPU and updating without atomics, and it was a lot less efficient um, doing normal loads and stores. Uh, and I think that was only on Xeon. I didn't try with other architectures. but. Um, but that was one of my early experiments. I, I set that aside and I want to look at that more. But my suspicion is, um, you know, the, the processor, when you do an atomic, you're actually telling the CPU something that it doesn't know when you're just doing normal loads and stores. That there's a chance for it to optimize the update at the appropriate level in the cache hierarchy. And I think that's what's going on there. That's why these, the actual atomic updates on each bit is more efficient than a, a per byte update. You know, the, the per byte is great for programming flexibility. You know, the programmer doesn't have to think about, um, uh, you know, some uh, data sharing and how it's shared. The cache hierarchy does the right thing. 
moving thing around, moving things around every time you set a byte. But the atomic can, you know, make the update at a higher level, the hierarchy, cache hierarchy that's then seen shared by everyone, um, and it just turns out to be better. Thank you. So, uh, you sorry, I came in late, so I didn't, I okay. didn't get to make this comment earlier when describing the sparse bit mask sorry, over here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but what you described sounds exactly like a data structure that we added for the multi queue block layer. So, uh, I don't know if you came across lib uh, spit map. So, when, what is called lib what map? What? S B I T M A A P. So, sparse bit okay. map, basically. Yeah. So, it'd be really cool if we could just reuse that code instead of. Uh, having two implementations of the same idea. Sure, they want to avoid duplication of code, yep. for sure. Um, cool, thanks. Th th there was, um, probably not the same, th th there is an existing sparse set abstraction in the kernel, but it's very different than what I have, and it's really designed around being able to sleep and wake on uh, when bits are set in the set, and there was no overlap between that and my work. I, I wasn't aware of the abstraction you're talking about. I'll, I'll take a yeah, look. so the, it, at least the, the sparse bitmap implementation that we have, it has the two modes of operation. There's just the sparse bitmap and there's a sparse bitmap with a wait queue on top of it. Mm. But you can use the spar sparse bitmap by itself. Oh, you do have a wait queue. We, then maybe I was looking at that. But. Maybe. No, I think you were looking at the CPU IDA, which like didn't exist uh, last week. Mm. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll figure it out offline, but, but point taken, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. All right, we're actually, we're coming close on time and to stay in schedule, I should probably get through the last few slides here. Um, so the Noom issue. So I wanted to avoid Noom issues by sticking to the local level cache and, uh, you know, fond hopes, but it didn't work that way. So it, it turns out that the stealing code caused some regression on Hackbench on the large Numa systems, like eight node systems. And, you know, very, very puzzling. Why should it do that? Um, and as, you, as I looked into it, I could see that the CPU time had pretty much increased across the board. You know, all functions, kernel user land, you know, uniformly inflated. It was just taking longer. And looking even further, I could see that that was correlated with more cross-node migrations of these Hackbench tasks. Um, now, why should that be? Well, it's this little bit of code in the wake-up path where we, we wake. Um, and so we have a waking task, we wake someone else, and we're making a decision, the wakey who's come runnable, is he gonna run on the place that the waker just woke him up, or is he gonna go on his previous CPU? So we make that decision. And the code looks and says, you know, essentially looks and says, well, is the previous CPU idle? Um, is this current CPU almost idle? And by almost idle, there's this thing called a synchronous wake up, where the assumption is um, if, say, a sender is waking receiver, um, that the sender is going to be done very soon and going to go off CPU. And therefore, if on the sender CPU, if he's the only one running, he's going to go off, it's going to go idle very soon. So it makes a lot of sense to put the receiver there and get him to take his place and pick it up in the L1 cache and all is wonderful. So there's that logic, it, it works well. However, what happens with stealing is that this condition, you know, the number running in the CPU is one, is two more often. Stealing, for, for any given number of tasks, base versus the steel kernel, the load is just smoother. This NR running one condition is two more often. And so we make this decision to move to the you know, Waker's CPU more often. And, and this is agnostic about NUMA. It'll move things right across the NUMA node. And that's what's happening. So we're seeing more migrations um, in the stealing kernel, and, uh, and it's slower. So to, yes, Daniel. Yeah, okay, so I'll move right along. So anyway, so I've had to disable this for more than two NUMA nodes. Um, I suspect this is really a hack bench effect and realistic workloads. Uh, will run just fine, and I actually love people's help in evaluating this uh, theory. And so if you download my patches and try it, there's a command line tunable you can set, a uh, schedule steal node limit, and that's the number of nodes uh, above which uh, stealing is disabled. So set that to eight or higher and give things a try and, and tell me what you find out. Okay, and these are details of that I'm not gonna go into. So future work. So uh, the current patch, as I told you what it does, but possible extensions, these same principles, the sparse set could be applied in the um, RT uh, task load balancing. It already looks for overloaded CPUs. It could be made more efficient. Um, we, could, we could combine stealing and idle balance. Um, they're trying to do the same thing. Um, and whereas now the stealing tracks overloaded CPUs on a per LLC basis, as you traverse the scheduling domains, you could look for overlap between your domain 
and the appropriate per LLC set and decide which um, overloaded CPU set to traverse and pick a candidate from. So someday, perhaps, we could replace the existing idle balance with that. Um, ARM has this, well, ARM and other architectures uh, have this feature where some CPUs are faster than others, and as, as a result, you can end up with these so-called misfit tasks, where a task is the only guy running on a CPU, but it's running on a slow CPU. And a fast CPU might go idle. Well, you'd like that fast CPU to be able to pick this guy up. Except the, the target here has NR running equal one. It doesn't look low overloaded. So you could possibly extend this logic to have a second set of you know, NR running equal one things on slow CPUs, and they're stealing candidates when a fast CPU goes idle. Um, and I'm going to skip a few of these for time. And lastly, the sparse mask could be applied in other places. You can imagine using it on the push side as well um, to make the search for idle cores and CPUs more efficient. So um, all these things could each map to a task at some time in the future, and I hope to pursue those. So uh, that's it. Daniel tells me we're out of time. So if you want to talk more, I should probably do it after in the hall. So thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Let's talk like that. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shubra Mazumdar. So I will talk uh, more about the scheduler scalability on the push side that Steve touched a little bit. Uh, and so I'll focus uh, mostly on the context switch intensive workloads where essentially the scheduler is uh, pushed to the limit. And by context switch intensive, I mean uh, where workloads where threads are waking up, doing uh, a little bit of computation, and then going to sleep. And that's happening like all over the place and like lots of threads. So uh, on the push side, uh, actually there are like uh, two paths the currently the Linux scheduler follows. There is one uh, slow path, I think people call it, where uh, it is taken if uh, it's a new exec uh, task, like a new for new fork task, or there is no affinity between the waker and the wakey. And the other path is uh, we call the fast path, where uh, it's, it's much faster. It's just trying to uh, find an idle CPU as uh, soon as possible to schedule the newly uh, woken up task. So that's the path mostly I'm focusing on today. Uh, so it starts uh, for the fair class. It actually, the story starts with the call to select idle sibling, which is essentially trying to find the best possible CPU uh, in the last level cache domain. So it first tries to find a fully idle core, because obviously, like, who doesn't like a fully idle core? It's the best CPU. Uh, any CPU in that code is the best to run. And if it fails, then it tries to find uh, any idle CPU in the LLC domain. And then it again tries back and tries to find another idle CPU like last try in the local core. I think because uh, the logic there is like uh, you have spent some time searching the LLC domain, maybe in the meantime uh, something got idle in the local core, so you just give one more try. And believe me or not, this actually, the selected idle SMT has some effect. Like if you remove it, you will see some <laughs> difference. Uh, so currently, the so I'll focus on select idle core and select idle CPU. The select idle core, it can actually iterate uh, basically all the CPUs in the LLC domain. So it basically uh, scans core by core and effectively finds a core where all the CPUs are idle. It 
basically returns from that. And after that comes the select idle CPU, which also can actually end up, uh, in the worst case, scanning the entire uh, LLC domain. So it actually tries to be intelligent, uh, but I'm actually not fully convinced by the current logic now. So it uh, iterates uh, NR CPUs, where NR is determined by the, the average idle time of the, uh, the current CPU and also the average cost of scanning the LLC domain. And the logic right now is you scan up to the point where it is equal to the time, the average idle time of the CPU. And on top of that, so this I'm, I, I, I don't see like what is the logic in that, why it should really depend on, the, on these two things because uh, when a task is woken up, you essentially want to uh, put it on some idle CPU as soon as possible. And that shouldn't depend on what is the average idle time of the CPU that is entering the task. So I don't, I, I'm not fully convinced there. And I remember there were some email exchanges with uh, Peter some time back and he kind of agreed and I, he sent some of his own patches. So, uh, so there is some contention point there. And it also has an arbitrary first factor. Right now it has some 512 number and if you read the comments, like it helps hack bench. So <laughs> it's like uh, fine tuned for one particular benchmark it seems. And in the worst case, I think uh, even with all these things going on, it can end up uh, scanning the entire uh, socket, which doesn't scale. So, so my uh, my feeling is that it will be probably very hard. Firstly, I'm not convinced that this formula should be dynamic in the in the first place. And even if we try to do something intelligent and try to come up with some dynamic formula, uh, probably it will for some percentage of time it will not work really. And uh, if you step back, uh, ideally, I feel that this cost time of uh, searching should be actually constant time. It should not really depend on kind of how loaded the system is and stuff like that. So it's, it, sh it should have some uh, upper bound on the, on the search, like constant upper bounds. And what should the bounds be? So essentially, I started experimenting with, uh, with a lot of hard-coded numbers like uh, a lower bound with uh, two CPUs, upper bound with four CPUs, and I tried different architectures of uh, SMT2, which is essentially Intel machines, and then we had some uh, Spark machines, uh, which had SMT8 hyperthreading. And uh, uh, experimenting some, I, I kind of realized that what works well is a lower bound of one core and upper bound of two cores. So you may ask why, and I, I don't have a concrete answer to that, but uh, I have some feeling that this, uh, it's, it's uh, so a lot of the scheduler algorithm is essentially like uh, working on domains, like you have the core domain and the LLC domain and stuff like that. So some load balancing, it could be that the domain next to you, so the core is the lowest domain, and it could be that the core domain next to you kind of has a different uh, load profile. So it's usually a good idea to at least cross your current core boundary when you are searching for an idle CPU, uh, but then you also don't want to search too much. So two is kind of the, uh, the minimum number that you allows you to go beyond the core level but still have like search a different core. Uh, so that kind of, uh, when I tried, uh, it kind of worked on uh, at least the Spark and the Intel machines uh, uh, that I had. Uh, so, and the other thing is that uh, the CPU ID enumeration, so on uh, Intel actually, the CPU IDs are interleaved. So CPU zero is on one core and one is on the next core and it kind of hops. Whereas uh, Spark and certain other architectures, I think have like, uh, they exhaust one core first and then uh, move on to the next core. So, but uh, if you have an upper bound of one, uh, lower bound of one core and upper bound of two cores, I um, mean any kind of possible CPU ID enumerations, you will always at least see more than uh, one, uh, search more than one core. So, uh, the, uh, but if you, now the problem comes that if you uh, bound the searches, the problem is that you can be uh, uh, localized in an effect. Like uh, if it is a loaded CPU, you're not searching enough. So there could be some idle CPUs far away uh, that you are not able to find. So uh, actually, yeah, some of the, this suggestion actually came from Steve uh, when you were uh, trying to do uh, experiment with this stuff. And what we found was, uh, uh, if, we, if we can just keep a per CPU variable to uh, track uh, the search limit of uh, 
how much you have searched so in a very loaded case if you didn't find any idle cpu your part cpu variable still like uh, mark the end of your search and next time when you start searching again when you become uh, a runnable you start searching from that so even though you are searching a small window you are kind of able to uh, spread around your search window in the llc domain so you don't get localized so uh, these two techniques coupled together actually uh, kind of worked well for most of the benchmarks uh, i tried uh, so now coming uh, to the select idle core uh, which is the, which is the first one that the scheduler tries so it has currently a dynamic switch uh, that is tries to uh, disable the scanning essentially it flags like okay there are no idle cores available so don't even bother uh, but then uh, it is still a bottleneck because if you have one or a very low number of cores it still like goes on uh, all the way searching so uh, so can we have some efficient data structures to do it fast uh, i haven't done exhaustive research on this uh, but uh, I'm, I'm i'm somewhat skeptical because uh, what i found was uh, the scheduler fast path is uh, is very very sensitive so uh, any kind of data structures if you think uh, if you are touching too many cache lines or you are doing any kind of atomic operations so or anything can completely uh, ruin your margins so it will hurt probably more than uh, help you so what i found was actually just uh, disabling the idle core search on uh, this context switch intensive workloads uh, particularly on the x86 uh, the intel machines uh, that we had actually improves so that clearly proves that it it hurts more than uh, currently the state hurt more hurts more than it helps so the idea was basically can we have then uh, a new scheduler feature uh, so scheduler already had uh, like four or five existing features uh, so i just wanted to add one more to that so that uh, we can disable the idle core search uh, in the runtime and it it it, it improves most workloads regresses some for example uh, the hack bench on Spark, I found that actually disabling the idle core search completely can uh, regress uh, a little bit, like compared to just with the select idle sibling, uh, select idle CPU improvements. So here are some numbers I have. Uh, these are uh, the Intel x86 machines. Uh, we have total 44 cores and 88 CPUs. So I have Hackbench and then some networking workload, although it is running in the same like single node, uperf, which is uh, message, uh, messaging back and forth with 8 kilobyte. And then, of course, uh, the workload we care about the most uh, is the, uh, the Oracle database, OLTP or uh, TPCC, which is a OLTP workload. So, so you might not be impressed uh, by the improvements uh, a lot, uh, especially like Hackbench. It's, uh, there are some uh, big improvements and then like one big improvement and then uh, mostly like uh, in the lower single digit, same, uh, slightly better for ping, uh, uperf. And then uh, in the Oracle database, you'll see like some improvements showing up towards the higher end where the number of users are more. Uh, so I think like the effect of uh, the select idle CPU is most likely showing up towards the uh, higher end because uh, the dynamic switching is probably filtering out most of the select idle core things, so that is probably not making any difference with the uh, baseline and uh, and, the, and the patches. So this is just with the uh, uh, select idle CPU uh, changes. <coughs> so next, I tried with uh, the new uh, uh, scheduler feature. So basically, disable it using no sys core, and you can see that the improvements have uh, increased a lot. Uh, again, probably Hackbench not so much. And by the way, uh, I have tried on some other uh, machines, like slightly smaller machines, and Hackbench actually shows like much higher improvement, uh, like uh, crossing 10% easily uh, on uh, many number of groups. And you can see like the UPERF improvement is also quite a bit. And again, uh, this time the Oracle database uh, TPCC workloads workload actually is showing uh, something substantial, like. Uh, more across the chart, and uh, it's, it's not like, yeah, uh, at least like growth goes up to beyond 4%. Uh, so uh, so I'll stop here like, if there are any questions uh, about this. Uh, because I think that, yeah, the current uh, state of the push side is not uh, 
really optimized right now, so we need to look at it. Uh, you can we can spend a lot of time uh, trying a lot of heuristics, which I actually have done, but I found that uh, uh, doing easier things like this is actually like uh, it gives more stability and. Uh, you actually probably get the improvement rather than uh, trying to be super smart and like uh, complicated uh, data structures and en ending up hurting. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, I just wanted to probably uh, also point to Peter that he, we need to look at this side a little bit more. I have sent the patches upstream, you can find. Uh, uh, there are some initial discussions with Peter and some other folks back and forth and then, uh, yeah, it kind of, I haven't heard back after I sent like V2. So I can go back and start the discussion again after I return. Now, uh, switching gears a little bit. So, uh, so we are spending uh, so much time uh, optimizing the scheduler, the sleep, wake up, and all those paths. And uh, it occurs to me that on uh, some cases, we should just plain avoid it. So what are the cases? So if, uh, if you uh, profile your uh, benchmark, so this is my opinion, that if you profile your benchmark and you find like, uh, most likely I have seen like there are a few common hot stacks which must like uh, calling schedule. And in particular like if your benchmark has one stack that is kind of dominating and calling schedule all the time. And that is also a kind of a well defined point. Like uh, in this case I am pointing to pipe read and write. Uh, it can be either like reading from file system or reading from net uh, network. Uh, I think we should just avoid, uh, have some mechanism to busy wait and avoid the enter uh, overhead altogether. And this is not just the scheduling overhead, there is context switch overhead that is going into the sleep queue and uh, like removing from that and just avoid the enter stuff. And currently I found that, uh, so uh, while I was profiling the OLTP stuff, uh, the pipe thing actually showed up at the top. And uh, so I thought that uh, we should probably look uh, into, oh, there is a question there. Um, one thing that concerns me a little is all the tests that you did are with a system that is essentially fully utilized. And there are a lot of workloads this out one? there where the system is maybe 50, 60% busy. And so you want good response times for requests that come in. And finding an idle core for that might be more useful. So uh, for the, uh, I don't have the idle times here. Uh, for for the Oracle database, uh, TPCC runs, as far as I remember, uh, for 20 users, uh, it was like a lot of idleness. It was probably like more than 50% idle. And then that's why I kind of varied it uh, up to all the way up to 220, where I think the idleness is around 80% or something like that. Yeah, like beyond a point, I cannot drive it anymore. Kind of the throughput plateaued at 220 users. So I kind of stopped uh, there. So at least for the TPCC, I think uh, the idleness range covers uh, a lot. So, Schuber, as I recall, you did some experiments keeping the existing comparison of, of cost um, to idle time and applying the remembered search there, right? So, in other words, you let, you let the logic search as much as it currently does, but it would stop, and, and then you picked up where you left off the next time around. Did, did that give? Uh, what were the yeah, improvements there? I mean, there? Uh, I tried a lot of uh, things like that, uh, but uh, this one was the best, as far as I remember. I was, like, trying yeah. with all different combinations like uh, removing idle search and as Steve said, uh, plus that and then like there are like seven or eight different combinations I tried and what jumped out was this one kind of the simple thing does the best, uh, performs the best. So that's why I kind of stuck with it yeah. in the end. Okay. Uh, so, so coming back to the pipe stuff. So yeah, I think for uh, the pipe read and the write, we should have some uh, busy waiting uh, mechanism and this actually has uh, precedence. So networking has already similar mechanism in place. So I kind of uh, copied that part of the code a little bit, like I just saw how they implemented it. And it's, it's a very small change. And uh, again, like uh, we might go down the rabbit hole thinking like, can we have different dynamic formula of the optimal spin time, like uh, different workloads on different architectures, can you be smart enough? And this was like, uh, Mel Gorman, he had some uh, 
comments like that. But my feeling on this is this is again like we can spend a lot of time and effort trying to figure this out, but uh, uh, it's 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 going to be very tough because all different there are so many architectures with different spin time. So the easiest and more pragmatic way would be essentially to just have a tunable and uh, all architectures or whatever workload they are running, they can just set it to the sweet spot depending on their operating conditions and get the benefit. Uh, so I'm also looking like for uh, more workloads to try uh, for the pipes uh, thing. Uh, so the obvious things that jumps is uh, the Hackbench pipe and the Unix bench pipe where they're kind of message passing uh, where, uh, pipe. So that's obvious that that should give improvement. And I also plan to try uh, OLTP uh, because I, I still haven't installed on one of the systems that I intend to try it on. So I I'll probably in the next version of the patch uh, I'll have the OLTP numbers as well. So just to show some uh, basic uh, numbers like Hackbench pipe and Unix bench pipe, I mean the gains are huge and this is expected because uh, uh, these uh, threads are probably not doing much. They're just uh, running for a very small amount of time and it is dominated by the other system overhead. So uh, even the same for the Unix bench pipe. So that's why you see the gain so much uh, on a more real workload. Uh, will probably be like single digit uh, percentage, uh, my guess. And, and one thing to remember is that, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, this is needed because like anyway that you spend CPU cycles uh, going to sleep and then waking up. So uh, if you are waking up faster than that, of course, it makes sense to just be on CPU. Uh, in fact, that will also uh, bring down the CPU utilization in addition to giving performance improvement. Okay. so. There are a few uh, takeaways I had uh, like working on this scheduler and I, I really found at least uh, the part I have worked on for last few months. Uh, so optimizing the scheduler for performance is really hard and it's uh, basically for like a couple of different reasons. Uh, it's always a double edged sword because you cannot spend too much time uh, at least on the push side you cannot spend uh, too much time uh, finding any idle CPU it will hurt you. But then you also want to make an intelligent decision and spread out the thread uh, threads evenly enough so that there is no uh, you are not wasting CPUs. So it's very difficult to strike a balance between the two. Uh, secondly, uh, all workloads on the planet use the scheduler. So anything you change, uh, you have to test a set of exhaustive workloads on all kinds of architecture, and most people probably even don't have access to all kinds of architectures. And then you have to also vary the utilization levels uh, for each of these benchmarks. So just imagine the test matrix every time you have to go through when you change something. And uh, for the double-edged sword thing, uh, oh sorry, uh, for satisfying all workloads thing, sometimes the scheduler feature will uh, come to the rescue. For example, I just uh, decided that okay, we can put a syscore to kind of disable the idle core search, uh, which might hurt certain cases, but uh, then we can have a kind of a tunable thing. So that might uh, help. And uh, some food for thought, uh, will the LLC domain? Where do we stand on scheduler tunables? Peter. There. I think he likes get features. He has used a lot. <laughs> So SCAD features are under SCAD debug. This is a hint. It is not an API. We're not supporting it. If, okay. it, if it goes away and your database falls over, it's not my problem. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> I don't think it's practical for us to expect one scheduler to now work across this wide yes. variety of workloads. It, it's what been at once. Um, I mean, we can have some tunables, but there's there's always. Um, how many knobs do you want to turn? And then you tune it for the one workload, and then another workload comes into the same machine, and it completely falls over again. Um, so the, the tunables almost never work in practice. The queue will maybe tune it once for one workload, but 99.99% .99 of user will never tune it, and they will never even know that it's there. Yes. So the only thing that matters is the default. That's not true, actually. Well, so there is like 
zero point zero one something. Yes, percent. and so, and so you, tune you, it, you, you put this behind yeah. a tunable and it doesn't affect them. But it, you do make the tunable available to folks who do want to use this feature and it brings them the optimization that they want. I mean, yeah, for I example, this is coding, I can, by default, I left it as same as the baseline. So I just, I just okay. disable it with workloads. Okay, but then the, the point is that we must much more concentrate on the default. Uh, so, uh, so for the default thing, so I, we, I, we can just say that the default is bad and we expect users to... So, but then to even how do you define a default? Do you vote, like, uh, how is one workload more important than the other? Default, That's like, what, when I build dev config, whatever it gives me is the, is the default. So, sorry, I... I could you repeat what you just said? I into the mic. Um, I'm saying that we must not consider that the default doesn't matter it's, and make it bad and expect oh, I, people I to tune. Like no, I don't think anybody is disagreeing with you. The question is, what is default? What is the workload Linux is targeting? Yeah. What is it? Whatever it runs on it now. <laughs> um, uh, the traditional answer to that question is Linus's laptop. Well, yes, that. Um, but also, we shouldn't particularly suck at any one thing. Um, we can't win all the benchmarks, but we, str we try not to tank on any of them. But, but yeah, that I mean, is. Uh, he will not suck so much on anything. He will suck to some extent. That's the thing. He will never suck like. So fifty percent degradation, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. Okay, so I'll just uh, the last point is like uh, we can have the, the default conversation maybe after uh, offline. And the last point is uh, so a lot of things are tied to the LLC domain, and uh, we are searching that. Uh, will it actually continue to get bigger? So I know Intel has uh, twenty-eight cores uh, as of now in one uh, LLC domain, and AMD has thirty-two core chips, but. Uh, as far as I know, those are the multi-chip modules, so it essentially has like a four, four uh, LLC inside that. So there are like uh, I think eight, uh, eight cores per LLC. So how how big will it get? And yeah, uh, I I believe that Intel recommends these days, and someone who still works for Intel could perhaps confirm this: that if you're on a 28 core per socket box, that you actually uh, use a, a you, you partition it into like the soft NUMA kind of stuff, right? So I, I don't know what our official recommendation is, but we yeah, we have this feature, Subnuma Cluster is I think the last name yeah. for it. Okay, and for ARM also I know, I, I don't have direct access to any ARM prototypes, but uh, from the discussions I've seen like Ampere chips, uh, they have kind of a non-uniform cache architecture, so they also have like two cache uh, L3 core clusters in the last level. So, so my point here is that how big can it get, like uh, how, what is the worst case? Some, some food for thought, since we are trying to solve the scalability of the LLC scanning. So, so I think there's also physical limits to how big they can get it. Um, and I think we're very near there. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to, have to bother. Yeah. yeah, I know, but I mean, if... Um, Now, I mean, if, if you build a very large ring, um, at some point, the um, actual interconnect costs start to get pretty terrible. And, and so where is the point where we'll say no more and, and go to an actual NUMA? Um, so Yes, that. Well, so those trends are true when you end up with things like core clusters as an intermediate level. Right. And so the question for the scheduler is, so now do I push and only look for candidates within the core cluster? Because it's a smaller and I'm ignoring a lot of other potential IL CPUs. Or do we have to extend it to be a multi-level uh, search and, and in a scalable fashion? Right, something like that. Okay. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, we can have more questions like offline afterwards. Welcome back everybody to the Performance and Scalability Microconference. I just want to make a quick announcement before we get started again. If you ask a question, please state your name first so that we can credit you in the notes. Okay, we have Christoph Lameter and Mike Kravitz to talk about huge pages. 
still on, right? <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, um, huge pages is, I always had this law of hate relationship with huge pages. On the one hand, we want performance. On the other hand, why do we have to go through all this crap to make it possible? And why doesn't this work and why doesn't that work? And uh, so a lot of what we are doing is in that tension and making uh, uh, huge pages available for everybody in an easy way and uh, really wanting it basically just a clean uh, uh, software that we just run without it, right? So we have transparent huge pages, we have various uh, HTTP uh, libraries and all sorts of extra stuff. And so we're going to talk about a little bit about all these issues uh, today. And uh, Mike has done some uh, work on this. Uh, and um, do you want to say anything introductory? Yeah. Said, um, so if you're looking for anything new under the sun, you're not going to find it at this session. This is a little bit kind of the state of how things are, the problems that we face, some potential directions people are working in, but um, we're not really into solution space here. Well, we have a couple of ideas and stuff, of course, work in progress. Um, so um, now we're going to talk a little bit about what is the state of huge pages. So um, uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, the huge pages uh, gradually expand as time progresses. So most, one of the most exciting things that I see is the, uh, the use of DAX, where you can memory map uh, uh, non-volatile memory. And uh, I looked at the code and was thinking, what does it do? How fast can I get? And I saw it uses one gig mappings and two meg mappings, if possible, automatically. So uh, if you can use it, you can avoid all the issues with the 4K pages on Intel just by using DEX, for example. Yeah, I, I think that's probably uh, a nice direction that we're taking that would ultimately be nice to have in the core memory management to actually automatically use two meg or one gig pages depending upon what would be optimal. I know that there are some people working in this area, um, no patches out yet, but uh, are at least thinking about it and considering it. Um, your other two options, state of the art today, are you know the old, very old, huge TLBFS, which is you know if you want to use it, you've pretty much got to configure the thing. It's good for what I call single purpose use cases. Um, databases love it. They set up the machine in a particular way for their workload. They pre-configure, pre-allocate huge pages, and they're good to go. The other extreme, of course, is transparent huge pages. You don't uh, really know exactly um, what your workload is, but you can actually get some benefit by using this automatically with no very little uh, application or system configuration. Yeah, don't expect too much of, huge, of transparent huge pages. You can't use it with, with the file back mappings, and so you're restricted to heap and, and stuff only. And uh, a lot of people, whenever I say, well, talk about transparent huge pages, oh, I can use this for I.O. No, you can't. We wish, but we aren't there. Um, so, um, yeah? Better? Okay. okay. All right, so for transparent huge pages, you'd like to map with either two meg or one gig, depending what fits and, and what's aligned. Um, but my question is, and maybe for the Intel folks here, uh, are the number of uh, TLB entries that can support one gig too limited, uh, such that if we automatically made a lot of one gig mappings, we'd end up running poorly because of TLB thrashing? So certainly I've uh, used architectures in the past where that's a thing, and you have to apply heuristics as to how many of these mappings you allow, yes. and evict some, and downgrade, and it's right really now tricky. you have that problem, right? But future generations of CPUs will have more. So t today it's probably advisable to use to, to make huge pages on Intel, but that's an Intel issue. Various platforms have different requirements. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to say, can, can anybody from Intel kind of speak to the latest and greatest state of the art in that respect, as far as TLBs and support for one gig entry? No. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, you want to talk something? Yeah, and again, this is just kind of uh, restating what is, you know, kind of the current state of the art. So huge TLBFS, like I said before, it's usually pre-allocation at boot time or early sysinit time. Uh, memory is only available for huge TLBFS, so if you want to use huge pages in this way, it's pretty much a reservation scheme. 
uh, you're limiting the amount of memory available to other other users in the system um, to actually use it. Applications must change. Um, open MMAP calls to actually get access to this stuff. Not all file operations are even available, such as you can't write to a huge TLDFS file. You can only MMAP it. Um, the good thing about it is, is that you can use multiple huge page sizes. Um, it's architecture independent. Um, obviously, Intel, the sizes are two meg and one gig. Um, other architectures like ARM and PowerPC, um, you've got many, many more uh, huge page sizes you can choose from. Um, and dynamic allocation is possible, well, it's troublesome. Um, I know people using it this way today that you can actually dynamically allocate huge pages, but um, if you can't do it, you actually get a SIG bus to your application. You've got to catch and recover from that, so it's, it's very cumbersome to try to do that, but people actually are doing that today. Okay, any questions on huge TLBFS? This is a classic thing that we've done for more than a decade now. Uh, it's very well established, excellent documentation. Okay, everything's clear, good. Uh, then we have transparent and huge pages. Um, this is uh, the attempt to avoid the manual configuration, make it automatic. Uh, however, we end up with uh, um, M-advice calls basically that tell you which sections should be backed by huge pages and which shouldn't, shouldn't be. And gradually the use of transparent huge pages expands. First it was only anonymous memory, now we have shared memory and tempfs. Uh, you have no need for any changes to the uh, application. That's a great advantage. Um, and, uh, but there's only a single huge page size uh, supported. Uh, so the problems with huge page reservations are basically, I think, the same as with regular huge pages because you must have them. And if the system memory is, def is defragmented, uh, then you can't automatically generate uh, new huge pages. And the attempt to do so is extremely slow because the system will scan through all of your processes and all your memory, try to find linear mappings, and tries to then uh, uh, evict or move pages around so that you can, can uh, allocate a two meg segment. So as time progresses, that effort will be higher and higher. And uh, so you end up with a similar config issue as with huge pages, you have to pre-configure if possible, the number of huge pages you want and you need for your application. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to that. Um, as it says up there, no application changes required, but um, really, to take advantage of this, you need to make sure alignment and other type things are correct um, for optimal usage. And as it says, you only have availability for a single huge page size now, which is typically PMD size, which is 2 meg on Intel. Um, yeah, the main problems with the huge pages is uh, we can't really use the page cache. We really want that for I.O. throughput. Um, um, and if you want to reconfigure the system for a different size of, of huge pages, you actually may have to reboot the system. That's something of, of, of it's an enormous pain right now for my guys and my company. We have a lot of dependencies on uh, huge pages because you can't get the performance with 4K pages. And if you want to change the application, uh, you have to reboot the system because there's no contiguous memory available. And so changing the applications takes about 15 minutes to get the system down and up again, and that is pretty unnerving, especially on a computational cluster. Um, and the other thing is, uh, why do we have to deal with this crap anyways? There are other uh, platforms that have larger base page sizes, and on those, we don't see the problems at all. Uh, we have some power systems uh, in, in, in our lab, and the same application runs without any problems at all with 64K pages. Uh, similarly, we have also ARM systems that have the same uh, solution. They also have 64K pages, base pages, and you don't have any issues there either. You don't need to go through all the uh, huge page configurations there. And uh, so my big biggest gripe with this is why doesn't Intel also offer us uh, a reasonable page size so that we don't have to deal with this crap? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so a larger base page solves some problems, but not all. The, 
The problem is that our applications require an exponential range of page sizes to cover the different data usages, right? And, and, and there are some characteristics, right? You know, stacks like to be in, you know, 64K and above range, you know, text maybe, you know, a couple hundred K, you know, a couple meg, so, you know, maybe two meg at the upper bound. But then the, the data segments, the non-segments, you know, they're huge. And you can have some large memory applications that have, well, as you know, terabytes of data, and those need the maximum possible page yeah. size. So simply bumping up the base page size isn't going to improve the TLB miss rate for, for that kind of access pattern. Well, it definitely changes uh, the, the behavior by a f uh, factor of 10 for me. Well, uh, well again, but again, that, that's <laughs> totally application dependent. Yeah, so. that's, that's, that's true. So that, that ideally, you would have to have a multiple page size that we can pick on uh, whenever we want, right? So um, true. Yeah, so, so it, I used to work with Spark, um, yeah. and I still miss it, but, you know, I'm moving on. But one of the great things about <laughs> it was that, you know, e it had a relatively small TLB, 128 entries per core, mm -hmm. but it was fully associative, and you could have any page size, and it offered a large range of sizes, mm -hmm. you know, all the way up to uh, 16 gig and, uh -huh. and down to the base page, 8, 8K. So it was easy for software to pick a size that match the particular segment need without any penalty. So it's very flexible. Yeah. And I'd really encourage the other CPU designers to consider such an architecture. Well, uh, the problem is also the memory size is ever increased. We have machines now with a terabyte of main memory, and it is pretty standard to uh, shift around four, gig four gigabyte pages, four gigabyte files throughout our, our network infrastructure. And a four gigabyte uh, file requires one million um, 4K entities to, for the OS to manage, which is not that simple. Um, so, work in progress. Um, there's uh, work in progress to have more support for file-based mappings. And I think Matthew uh, just got this X-ray in, which is one of the basic points to get that going, hopefully, at some point. Um, then, uh, I think you are working on the uh, page cache support for the huge pages. So hopefully we'll get there. It's, it's pretty slow. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not working on that. I think that was Kirill shoot them off. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So your work. I think your work just to. Uh, to make the pages available. Yeah, just to make <laughs> huge pages available. I mean, there's the, uh, when we talk about transparent huge pages and what Christoph was talking about is when you need one, you've actually got to find one somewhere. And so you have this whole issue of, well, we've got to migrate away usages. We've got to find a contiguous area where we can actually get a huge page. And I know that you are working in that area. So there's kind of multiple ways we're kind of trying to approach this. Everybody tries to do a small bit. Hopefully, at some point, it all comes together. Uh, I've also proposed a patch set to uh, reserve parts, pages of an arbitrary order. Uh, the fundamental problem that we have if we use multiple page sizes is uh, that memory is defragmenting, and we cannot recover uh, the contiguous nature of memory. And that is required, actually, to have a consistent and reliable allocation of varying uh, sizes of pages. Uh, so. Even just having huge pages and regular pages in there causes basic issues at the management layer. So um, with that, we uh, come to some of the esoteric things that we still that are still in progress. Um, so, for example, I, I'm trying to increase the, abi the ab uh, ability of the kernel to in to be able to defragment memories by making the slab objects movable. That's one of the key things that uh, always uh, keeps uh, the uh, defragmenter from able, able to recover two make pages, for example. This is a kind of a significant uh, intrusion into the way that the system works and gets us too close to Java-style garbage collection in the kernel. I think, I think it's very offensive to many. Um, <laughs> but uh, somehow we need to get there. Um, then there's, there's the idea here, maybe we can just on x86 uh, create a, a, a custom uh, Linux kernel that will just run with a 2 meg page, base page size. With that, we don't, wouldn't have an issue anymore with fragmentation. We have just a separate area for uh, a Linux kernel that runs with 2 meg. Um, there are system components that are already prepared for that, like the slab allocators. 
So uh, it may not be that much of an effort if somebody really has some dedicated time for this to get that going. Uh, also, I know that the, uh, I've heard that the binary format under uh, x86 has been pre prepped for 2 meg uh, layouts. So the text segments and all the other segments are aligned at 2 meg boundaries so that binaries will just load and run on a 2 meg VM. So uh, if somebody has some dedicated time on this, we really appreciate that to get this going if possible. Then my guys and my company have issues with constantly having to reconfigure um, the, uh, the systems because of very huge page sizes for various applications. So there's some uh, work in progress using Ansible and trying to come up with some configuration techniques to more or less automatize these things based on application profiles and stuff like that so they can automatically uh, reboot the system and reconfigure it for the applications you may want to run on this. This is an awkward workaround against the main problem here, but it seems to be the one that may be necessary in the, in the short term future. Um, the other thing that I want to do and is pressure Intel to increase the page size, right? I've tried to try do that for 15 years now, not successful, uh, but um, that may be uh, a good thing. Um, and then we have the approach here to increase the mobility of, of, of uh, 4K pages. And uh, ultimately what I want to get to is to be able to uh, um, move the entries and inodes around in main memory so that we can uh, deal with issues where you have access to a huge amount of files and then you switch to load to do something else. At that point, we'll have a lot of slab pages that just have a single entry or inode in there, and a lot of memory is being wasted, and this memory is locked down so that you can't uh, uh, re recover large contiguous segments because there's this one object that's sitting in the one 4K page that blocks all the recovery of a 2 Mac page. So that's one thing that uh, I hope to be able to get done hopefully next year. But I've been telling, that, telling you that for 10 years now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, d I don't have much more to say here, but um, just like to open it up for issues people have, suggestions, anything? Yeah, actually, uh, recently we were trying to uh, use the PMP FSTHP as the backend for Cumul Water Machine to uh, instead of a uh, huge TLB FS. But we are uh, experiencing a problem with the Redis tree. Because when you uh, insert the THP into Redis tree, you have to uh, insert it as a 4K, a normal 4K page. But for huge, all of uh, But so, uh, I'm fixing that. <laughs> you are fixing that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, for the huge TLB FS, you just uh, insert the page as a huge page. That's a multi out or huge page. So it's a problem we are experiencing. Yes. Um, okay, so the so the, 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 the first step of this is in, which is the conversion to the X ray API. Uh -huh. um, the the second step is to convert lookup to the point where uh, pa page lookup so that if it sees so, 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 so right now we insert, w when we insert a two megabyte page, we put in uh, the 512 consecutive page pointers. Mm -hmm. The next step is to convert the lookup code so that when it sees a head page, it knows to, ins it, 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 it looks up, okay, relative to the 512 entries for that head page, uh, wh where are we in in, in that page, mm -hmm. and so it, it will insert point, so, so it will return a pointer to the sub page, okay. right? <coughs> and K Kirill kind of prototyped this. He, I think he did it in, in, in a not very um, well thought out order, but he's, he, he, if, if you look through his patches, this, this is there. Um, so w once we have that in, then we can switch to, instead of inserting 512 consecutive page pointers, we insert 512 pointers to the base page. Once that's done, we can then instead, instead of inserting 512 entries, we can insert uh, what is going to appear to be one huge entry. Well, it actually looks like in the Radix tree, data structure is having a single pointer at a higher level of the Radix tree, and then seven consecutive entries which say, don't look here, look at the, look at the base um, address instead. 
Um, and then from the page cache point of view, we're done. What I <coughs> am working on, and I'm gonna be talking more about this probably at uh, 4 p.m. in the kernel track. Um, what, what we're gonna do at that point is change the underlying representation of the page cache from being a radix tree to being a B tree. We are currently working on a, uh, an RCU safe B tree. Um, and then that will truly be one pointer rather than being this hack where we have seven <coughs> references over to the, uh, to, to the base page. And at that point, we, we, we should actually be able to put um, arbitrary sized pages into the page cache, not, not just power of two, but actually arbitrary size. The, the, the page allocator is not gonna be happy with the, with, the thing, with the idea of putting arbitrary size pages in, but we could do something like that if there's demand for it. And so the, what, what, what I'm trying to get to is that the, the, rad, the, the, the radix tree will no longer be the problem. Um, and then maybe somebody else can do some of the work, because I'm kind of sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for the short term, does the multi-order radix tree can help? The multi-order radix tree is gone. It's gone. It's gone. I, I deleted it. it, it as, as part of the X-ray conversion, the multi-order radix tree is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the so so the multi-order um, pay the, the multi-order X-ray stuff uh, okay. will do just about everything the multi-order radix tree did, just slightly better. Um, but we'll. It, I mean, it, it it shouldn't be too much longer before we actually have the um, the 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 eight, eight entries part of this. This, this, this. this should be in pretty soon. Uh, this is a follow-up to Stephen's questions on the future Intel CPU, the TLV entries. So uh, for <coughs> Canon Lake, there is a, unfortunately there's no, no change in the number of uh, TLV entries for a large page, but um, there are some uh, work in the futures for for the follow-on CPUs, but um, you probably ha have to get an NDA say, to get that information, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 and um, g g given the recent CPU roadmap changes that have been become public, the information you get under a NDA may not reflect what happens in the future. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so one uh, thing that I was missing from user mode perspective is to ask, so, so usually a, a, a robust uh, program would allocate memory with, with MAP, either an, an anonymous MAP or, uh, or even a, a, a O, a temp file open on, on on some other, on a temp or whatever. Right. And uh, so I'm missing the feature of asking the, the Linux kernel to allocate a two megabyte aligned address for me. And so we do crazy stuff like ask for two megabyte more and align that pointer. And it's not wasted because I'm not page faulting that extra margin. But uh, it kind of sounds kind of uh, helpful that the kernel would have a facility for me because sometimes, you know, especially when we have these two megabyte features opening up for us and we know we're aiming for them and we know we're, we're <coughs> trying to use them, it's good that we have a, a two megabyte aligned pointer in the user space. What were you going to say, Chris? I mean, I agree on, you know, if you use huge shield VFS, of course, you're going to get back a two meg. Exactly. But when you're doing something like just for THP, you don't get back. You get something page aligned, which may not be two meg aligned, which would be optimal for your case. Yeah. I mean, Solaris. So it's just like a missing feature. Solaris had a map align feature that you could just, you basically used the void star uh, argument and was treated as the alignment required for the mapping. Um, that might be a pretty straightforward thing to implement. Well, if, if you want to use transparent huge pages, then you have a transparent, right? It's not uh, really a huge page. It's, it's just uh, trying to do as much as possible. If, if you do an explicit request for a huge page, you get the proper alignment. 
Yeah, but then it will fail. You, well, you can't you can't get it do an explicit request I'm for not, transparent I'm, huge pages. No, no, but you can't request a manual huge page. But he doesn't want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to force. I don't want to force that system. Right. That if that system if the system doesn't give me or doesn't have available huge a lot of huge pages for me. I don't care that this underlying file system does what it can, but it's ju it just wanted to hide it, hidden, you know, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. I, but Emmet, Emmetvise does do that, Christoph, but it's after the fact. It's okay. after you set up is the it? mapping. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, is there an Emmetvise that can? There uh, is an Emmetvise to say use transparent huge pages, but oh. it's after you set up the mapping, so you still you <coughs> don't have the alignment. I think. Excuse me. Correct. Uh, I was just going to say for, for for DAX because we do want to encourage huge page mappings. We do. Uh, we do we, when when anybody calls them map, we, we we ask for a two meg alignment just by default, even if it, exactly. uh, for everything. Um, uh, but that's that's kind of like a, a per file system policy. Exactly. Uh, there a lot of, in the, the in kernel. A lot of subsystems have done that. And you know, just copy pasted that thing instead of just having a central place of saying yeah. mapping uh, user mapping two megabyte line. Yeah. It's not going to waste a lot of. I mean, I, I think it would be straightforward to add it to a tempfs or sh mem file system that has actually requested to use huge pages. That would probably be make sense to align it to two meg. We, 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 in those cases. we could just change the heuristics at the top level. If the user has asked for a mapping size which is greater than two megabytes, uh, then happen to return a two megabyte aligned address. Oh, gosh. <laughs> If I'm asking for a length that is two megabyte aligned, then probably I'm looking for two megabyte aligned alignment. Yeah. <coughs> no, I, I, I actually disagree. This, this, as long as you've asked for some, if you've asked for a length which is more than two megabytes, is two megabytes or more, then you can benefit from having a THP. You don't, you don't need to say, well, it isn't two, you know, it's, it's, it's two megabytes plus one page, therefore we won't two megabyte align it, because that, you know, there's two megabytes there where you could have had a benefit from it. So I would like to share some of our, our experience. Like we found this is extremely helpful to like uh, put your application tags on the huge page. And we really haven't got a very easy way to do that. So we have a very high key way, pretty much we <coughs> see this, or we, we identify which is the hot tags you're gonna use a lot. And we put them together and, uh, and try to put like find a, a line uh, like two mic meaning my move the front and the back uh, to extend to maybe more than like a, a two meg, maybe four meg, just get that aligned and we do a map, uh, then M advice, huge, and we, that's pretty much zero all your instruction and you need to somehow copy your instruction back, which is, but that works to give us like a multiple percent savings. But we're, we're looking for a better way to either with huge TLBFS or like a, a THP. But we, we haven't got a really easy one. As the one closest we found is to put all your like application binary in uh, TimeFS and use MAdvice and huge TLBFS, which is closer <coughs> to uh, that. But in our case, we, we cannot afford putting the whole binary in uh, DRAM because that's the uh, cost money as well. So we, we're, we're actually <coughs> we're actively looking for solutions to to get that uh, uh, to put your tags in the huge page, so we get uh, less uh, instruction TLB misses. Well, if the page cache work is successful, then we can have that, right? But uh, until that time, you have to suffer. 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe help us a bit <laughs> to get this done. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my hope as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So back to application hints again. R really, it can be fairly simple. You look at the MMAP segment size. If they're mapping something, you know, you know, above two meg and less than, you know, three, four gig, something like that, then you line it to two meg. If they're mapping something that's hundreds of gig, you line it to one gig, <coughs> and then, and then you let the uh, the later hints or, or attempts to use huge pages pick the largest possible page. That, again, with other operating systems, we we've done this and it's worked really well. And yep. you don't want to modify the apps. Like the kernel does that for anonymous memory already. Yeah. For trans, that's a trans that's a transparent huge page scheme that doesn't work for executives right now because they are page cache based. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, I think we are almost out of time. Right? Last question. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs> Good to have a heard from you. So uh, my name is Feng Bo Chun. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a thing. Uh, I come from Huawei, and today I'm going to talk about uh, an example of uh, the problem we might in the <coughs> using working queue and uh, with respect to uh, CPU hot plug and a possible solution uh, that it's uh, basically a, a, a workaround, I would say. And also uh, there is something. Uh, I think it it would be good to have in the work queue uh, API. So let's begin. Uh, uh, the first thing is the uh, the background story. Uh, one day that uh, Paul, Paul McKinney decided he wanted to uh, parallelize uh, the expat grace period uh, initialization of sorry uh, of RCU. So uh, he did some commit and uh, there there is the uh, code for the main uh, knowledge uh, logic. Uh, so uh, it did the thing that for each, you know, the leaf node of RCU, and uh, then it init a uh, work and put that work in a delicate work queue, and then uh, set a flag, and then they wait for all the flag. Uh, if if there is a, if the flag is set, then the, then he flush all the work from that work queue. So uh, uh, I'm going to explain a, a little bit about the the RCU node. So as your node is, um, you know, it's a range of CPU, uh, which is um, uh, as your node is basically smaller than a Numa node, uh, but uh, as I said, it's a range of CPU, so it's bigger than a uh, uh, Numa CPU. So uh, uh, why does Paul McKinney want to uh, parallelize the grace pair initialization? Is because that on a large system there are many uh, RCU nodes. So uh, the, inert, inert, the sorry the initialization will take a long time if we do that uh, sequentially, uh, and uh, there are some people report the the problem that uh, the there the, the the synchronized RCU for expedit expedit uh, take take uh, quite long, uh, and uh, the major problem is the in th in the initial. Uh, freeze. So that's the purpose of this work. And, uh, you know, it's a, so the solution is that, you know, goes through all the uh, leaf nodes and, uh, you know, use the work queue to, uh, uh, to parallelize the work. So but, uh, and then we hit this problem. And uh, so it's basically uh, the last two lines is 
uh, the most uh, informative is that we have a, a work queue lockup, and uh, the 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 logs that the, the uh, PWQ state is um, is uh, the basically means that the PWQ zero is offline. So what does this happen? Uh, why does this happen? Uh, uh, look at so if you look deeply for the look carefully for the uh, work queue API, uh, there is a, a thing that the caller must ensure that when it queue the work, it's like it, it must ensure that uh, you know the the CPU is not off offline or the in the in the queue uh, in the whole queue process that uh, there is no hot plug on the CPU. So that's the caller. That's the uh, requirement for the caller. So, uh, like we s we can see in this uh, in this code, uh, when we do the when we queue the work on this view. Oh, oh uh, by the way, the uh, group low is the uh, like like I said, RCU node is a range of CPU, and the group low is the uh, the lower CPU, and the group high is the higher CPU in that range. So it just uh, pick a uh, pick, uh, CPU in that RCU node uh, because that uh, it gains better uh, local, uh, because that uh, we want the work to execute uh, locally in, in the RCU node. So we, queue, so we will queue that node on that CPU. And, uh, but you look at the code, there is no way to ensure that uh, the CPU is not offline at the moment when we queue the work. And uh, particularly in that problem, I think uh, uh, the, re the reporter said there is hardware bug, so that CPU zero is offline all the time. So that's where we, we hit them. So, uh, uh, so I come up with a solution. Uh, uh, basically, we need to, uh, it, the, if you know the uh, uh, reason why this, uh, uh, why this problem happens, it would be easy to fix that. You just make sure that when we queue the work on, we uh, make sure that the CPU is not offline. So uh, we can check that in the CPU online mask. And uh, if we, if all the CPU in the RCU node are offline, then we queue it in an unbound uh, work queue, which will always uh, get scheduled and run the work. And uh, so uh, note that there is a, uh, preemption disable uh, section here. Uh, so in theory, we should use the uh, CPU hot plug logs to prevent that uh, to 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 get the uh, accurate uh, CPU online mask. But um, I think here we can. Yeah. 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 Because that. Preempt disable, it's really the wrong tool here because while it by accident prevents CPU hot plug, yeah. there's no semantic guarantee for it. Yeah, yeah. And I really hate it when people have make that assumption because it's broken. And one day it will be cured though. Pardon? One day it will not be cured. Yes. So one of uh, the for, for, for the camera I said one day it won't be true anymore. Yes. So we are working hard to get this stuff not done please don't try to re to to uh, rely on preempt uh, on preempt disabled for for this kinds of things we need we need better <laughs> semantically defined solutions for that uh, problem we have thomas is that uh, if we put a prep uh, a cpu hot plug disable there we deadlock because of people doing grace periods in uh, notifiers yeah, I know. But but still, we need to find the solution. Which this is the typical duct tape we removed all over the place, and don't add duct tape back. So I'll be talking to Sebastian this evening. There's a we're having an informal buff on implementation yeah, I know. like this in RCU. Yeah, because I mean the the thing I know that I'm going to, or poor Sebastian is going to deal with that patch in a minute because he's it's going to break our team. Yeah, what, what I'm doing about that um, in, the, in the meantime 
is there's a check you can't see this in the dot 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 the one inside the loop right and that check looks for um, this is expedited if I'm not too confused still um, this is expedited yeah, yeah yeah okay and so the what happens in RT you disable expedited normally um, except during boot when you can't and so this code doesn't do anything for RT except during boot yeah I and know. so what, what I what I would do is put a check and say if it's during boot or if we're uh, I could do it now, except that somebody probably yell at me for putting a config thing that doesn't exist in mainline yet. But if we're at boot or if we're RT full, um, do it the boot time way, which just cycles through and calls directly. And that way, RT would avoid the preempt disable. Wouldn't happen. So actually, I rather want to have some solution where we'd be smarter about that and have, well, because the, the, the Q work on thing, a lot of people tripped over that and got it wrong, and we fixed a lot of places. Yeah, the, the so one solution ahead. would be, and that would be probably the right thing to do, to have a, a cube work on mask and hand in a possible CPU mask and do it in a central place. Well, for me, it'd be fine if uh, that would work, but it'd also be fine if it just silently, if there's some way I could say, I, ri I would like you to queue on the CPU, but you know, if that's a problem for whatever reason, just put it somewhere else and I don't care. Yeah, I mean, so, so we have to come up with something, but we really should do it at the work queue in a central place because this breaks again and again. Yeah, I'm with you there. And I'm with you there. I know who is going to clean it up. You or Tejan? <laughs> no, I have minions for that. All right. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering them. Okay. Yet I get volunteered. <laughs> Okay, okay, so um, not only just uh, this, uh, like, like this, like uh, Thomas said, not only just we should not use the uh, presentation disable here, also that, as Paul said, uh, we, we, we actually we don't care about, uh, you know, where, wh what uh, the CPU will execute that work, because just, uh, we just need to, you know, pick any, num any number, uh, any CPU in that CPU node, in that RCU node, uh, will be fine to execute to execute that uh, work. Uh, uh, so uh, using this way uh, also makes uh, also uh, lose us the scale uh, the flexi flexibility to you know use the scheduler scheduler to uh, schedule that work in another in a better view. So uh, that's what I think we can have a better solution. So basically. Uh, here we have uh, the limitation for the work queue API. Uh, if we use per view work, work queue, we can you know control to put item uh, to and to random parallel, but we need to deal with the hot plug thing. And uh, if we use unbound uh, work queue, and uh, it it only has a uh, new level of uh, parallel uh, uh, execution level. So uh, ideally, we we want the uh, work queue API to have the functionality to uh, either run like uh, n uh, works, which n is uh, greater than number of Numa nodes uh, in parallel, or we want uh, the the work queue API to provide a way to uh, run a work for uh, each uh, fine grained uh, group of CPUs. Uh, by fine grained, I mean that. Uh, smaller than the new one node, uh, for example, is actual node. And then uh, no need to worry about uh, the CPU hot plug. And uh, I haven't done any coding yet, but uh, uh, by looking the work queue code, I think there are at least three uh, possible solutions. Uh, so one thing is uh, we can uh, allow to queue a work on offline CPU in pursuit of queue. So basically it means uh, uh, the work queue has to have some uh, mechanism to uh, still a grab work from uh, from another uh, work, sorry, in a, uh, sorry, it should be a uh, work queue or something. Uh, for, uh, so a CPU, uh, 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 P, a PWQ should be able to steal a work from another PWQ if that PWQ is offline. So uh, that's, that's why we need, we need to uh, uh, modify the, the work queue code and to make that happen. And uh, the pros is that we don't uh, need to Introduce another uh, work queue API. We can just just use queue work on, and uh, the, the the downside is that we uh, when we do the uh, work item processing, we need to uh, 
uh, write code to care about that's the steal and grab thing in that code. And uh, also there is another thing I'm, I think I'm concerned about is that uh, the, the, work you, the work item steal and grab may uh, conflict with the load balance in scheduler because uh, you know the, the work queue and the scheduler may have different uh, region, different views of uh, you know which CPU is busy and which view should run uh, more work. So uh, we need to figure that, that out. And uh, another solution is that uh, I look into the NUMA uh, PW code and uh, it's actually, you know, we, uh, with some uh, modification, we can make sh it works like, like a uh, per ASU node uh, uh, PWQ, something like that. So it basically needs to uh, modify the allocation part and uh, uh, also, you know, have the own CPU to node my ping because uh, the because uh, this this one is important because uh, currently we use the the CPU to node mapping for NUMA node. So if we want to have fingering uh, node, uh, we need to uh, modify that, and uh, this should be uh, specific to every uh, work queue. If 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 that the work queue use that feature, so also we need to have different way to calculate the CPU mask, and uh, also, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 fourth one, I think that uh, the the new map PWQ already handle some uh, already handle uh, CPU plug uh, uh, greatly. So maybe can maybe we can use that code, but maybe we need to modify that to 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 make sure because uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we can we can handle the CPU hot plug case. And another solution is uh, so that in a uh, higher layer. So, which is, uh, you know, no need to modify work queue, but provide another layer based on work queue to show this. So, yeah, that's basically what I want to share with you. So, any suggestion or question? Okay, so I g will give this to Daniel. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna spend this relatively short period talking about a project I've been working on for a while now off and on called KTASK to parallelize CPU intensive work in the kernel. So I'm gonna try to motivate the problem up front first and explain a little bit about what KTASK does but hopefully leave the majority of the time for some feedback that I was hoping to get from you all. So there are a couple of times in the kernel, maybe more than a couple of times, when we burn a lot of um, CPU doing um, 
well, we operate on data at a large scale. So for example, at boot time, when we um, initialize the struct pages, when we start a guest with VFIO page pinning and have to pin a large rip, um, um, range of pages, <coughs> These things take a long time, and there are other CPUs on the system that stay idle, that, that prevent the applications, and even the kernel itself from starting or stopping more quickly. So, you know, uh, just as, as one example of the kind of speed ups this work can bring, when we're starting a large, you know, KVM guest on a big server, we can use threads to pretty great effect. So the idea is that since there are so many different places in the kernel that, that have this problem, and there are so many kind of nasty things you have to worry about when you start many threads, we want to encapsulate all the nastiness inside of a, a new API that can handle this for you. So uh, the basic idea with Ktask is that you pass in the size of the task, some start of the range, a thread function that does a part of the task, and a few other parameters that I'll talk about later. And um, Ktask will split up the work for you. It will load balance between the threads so that the start and stop times don't vary too much and one thread isn't holding up the other ones. Um, Ktask can respect other load on the system. So if it's very busy, then multi-threading and optimizing one kernel code path won't hurt those tasks. I do this by running the helper threads at the lowest priority on the system. And there are, other, uh, and, and there are some other specific details too to, to, to make that work well that I can go into if you want. Um, the, the thing should probably be aware of um, C group also. That's work in progress that can be done completely separately beforehand. Um, that's to do. Um, and you know, it can do uh, a few other things too. It can control where you run the helper threads on this node or that node of the entire system. So, so that's the basic idea of the framework. Are there any questions before I go on? I yes. Don't know. Um, why is is it really the right policy to say run at max nice for voice system disturbance? I mean, if if my task hap is running at maximum RT priority, the sysadmin has said I want this to execute with the highest possible priority. Shouldn't the work being done on its behalf by other CPUs also run at that same priority? That's a good question. And we, well, it's, we, it's worth some thought, but I will point out that the main thread stays at the current priority. So we, you know, we make progress in that one thread, but if you have a special case like that, maybe this framework isn't appropriate, maybe we have some more work to do to address cases like that. Your answer is essentially correct. With, with the, there's one task that has the right to run at high RT priority. That's the setup here, and and you answered that that one part that that one helper that one main thread runs at that RT priority. That's the only right you have. All the helpers run at the max nice. You don't have permission to do otherwise unless the system or the user gives it to you in some way. But if if I have a task that is running at R RT priority, and I spawn threads from that task. Those well, I, I understand, but the other, other CPUs might also be running RT things. You, you, you don't have a right to monopolize the whole system because your one task is RT. There, there might be other uh, yeah, high yeah, priorities. Yes, I do. There I do. I mean, that's kind, of the priority. that's kind of the point of the RT scheduling class. It, if you could globally look at the system and know there are no other, you know, things of that priority out there, then yeah, you know, you know have a ball, take the whole system. Uh, that's a step beyond what Daniel's trying to do right now. Yeah, but what, 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 I'm, what I'm saying is that if I were to divide up the work that, that needs to be done, assuming there even was a way to do this, but assuming that I can divide up the work into eight chunks and spawn seven extra threads and each one of those makes a syscall to do one eighth of the work, then I can do all that and all of those will run at RT priority. In an ideal world, yes, that th there is overhead to the parallelization, so you get yes, 50, 75 percent. So, in fact, you're using more resources than you would otherwise. So, it's not a not a perfect uh, parallelization in general. Right, but what what I'm saying is that th this this chooses to use less CPU, and 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 that task and th and that choice is being made for me by Daniel. 
<laughs> That's a good point. I mean, there's no reason we can't, yes. you know, add a way to change this behavior if you, if, if, if you have a special case like that. I'd be curious to hear what we're doing at that high of a um, priority level that uh, uses I'm that much, y you know. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. We, 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 need, we need users to come forward and say, oh, the, the, this, this thing that you've done introduces a problem in my program and here's why, but yeah. run into issues where one of those coworker tasks has, has gotten a piece of the work to do and then can't run anywhere because there's it's too low priority and there's no work to do and so your main thread is actually stopped by the fact that it this one piece has been taken has been basically reserved but is not actually getting executed yeah we address starvation so um, all of the of the threads run by taking the next chunk of work to do, and then when the main thread is done, it waits for all the other helpers to finish. And while it does that, it wills its own priority to the next helper, one at a time. And so we have at most one thread always running at the original priority of the caller to avoid that kind of a thing. One thing I wonder is like, uh, you are breaking that task into chunks of words, right? So uh, there cannot be dependency between the, the chunks of work, right? That's a requirement. To Not as it's written now, no, no. So uh, like, is it required to have um, like a division into chunks uh, beforehand or like can we have, for example, uh, spawn a number of workers and then they pick up work um, as they finish up with their previous work, for example? So, uh, let's see, I guess I'm missing the main thrust of the question, but I mean, the framework is written assuming that you know the size of the work to do beforehand. Right, but uh, I mean, you might know, um, uh, let's say you have a certain number of things that you have to process, right? But they might not be processed in equal times, so it might be that some part Could you of use the microphone? Sorry, I'm having a little oh, bit of trouble. Sorry. Um, so, uh, I mean, you might have a certain number of things that you want to process, um, and, and you, uh, uh, so you know the number of things, for example, but you might not necessarily know um, how much time uh, each of them would take to process. So maybe some part uh, will take more to process, some other part will take less mm -hmm. time to process. So instead of pre-dividing based on the number of items, it might be better to actually uh, pick up work as you finish off with your previous work. Uh, th in terms of like dividing it more equally? I, I suppose I, I address that partially by dividing the work into more chunks than there are threads. And so if there's um, varying time in each chunk, it can smooth it out a little bit like that. Yeah. yeah so I think I know of an example of what uh, he was saying, the, there was an attempt to parallelize uh, unmapping uh, page tables of a task. And one of the issues that were expected with that is you don't know beforehand uh, uh, the density of page tables in the, the different uh, areas of the virtual uh, address space. S so the, as you divide the task, uh, based on the virtual addresses, some of them might be more expensive than others. So do you think this could be used for, for, for this purpose? I do, and you know, I'm gonna speak to that case specifically because I, kn I know those patches. They were from Aaron, I think, like a year and change ago. Walking page tables, you're absolutely right. We don't know how sparse the mappings are, but the heavy part of that operation is actually freeing the pages back to the page allocator, and that's MMU gather type stuff. And when we make that list up, we actually do know exactly how long it is, and every single one is obviously backed by a page. That's what the list is. It's, you know, it's a list of pages. So you know, that's the part that we want to optimize, and I think it could work well for that. So you uh, showed some uh, like improvement numbers in the first slide, mm. but they're like uh, the pure paralyzing the task, right? What is the overall improvement in any real workload? Like while you paralyze some parts, some background tasks are being paralyzed. 
is there any tangible effect on a uh, overall real workload on the overall which sorry i mean uh, the initial uh, numbers that you showed on the first slide that's just the uh, 2x or 16x some of the numbers were there that's just parallelizing the task right you just measured the task when parallelized how much less it takes yeah i'm sorry i'm not following what you're saying uh, can you go to your first slide yeah uh, Yeah, so the uh, speed up. So that's just uh, the speed up parallelizing the task, right, using the uh, K tasks. But what is, uh, in a real scenario, certain tasks are being parallelized in, the, uh, parallelized in the background, like you're running database or some other workload. So what is the overall effect on I any kind of workload? If there's a competing workload, you're saying? I mean, if this parallelizing uh, thing is freeing up some resources or something, so you are doing it faster. But how does that eventually affect this? This I, any no workload will be speed up by that, right? Essentially, no real workload. Right. You're just I mean, measuring a small parallelizing thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, if there are other things happening on the system, then then obviously this won't be um, nearly as fast. But that's what we want. I mean, we we, we want to avoid um, disturbing other tasks just um, um, f um, um, for the sake of an optimization. So this is a real world. Uh, data on a uh, system uh, where you start uh, like a QMU and um, just um, that system is free otherwise <coughs> or you asking something else yeah I understand that but uh, like uh, this there are, so there are probably other things that are depending on this thing right and so speeding this up you're hoping that overall uh, things will improve what I'm saying, like, what is the overall improvement in any uh, uh, operational workload? Suppose database is running and some tasks are being sped up using K tasks. Is there any visible difference in like throughput overall? Stuff like that. Well, no. I mean, this this um, is about starting up a um, 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 VM. I, I mean. So, so, oh, okay. so K tasks is largely aimed okay, at you know tasks. So okay, okay. So so if you are using the startup example, so like what is the overall startup time reduction? Let's say. Well, that's what I'm showing that's, here. I that's mean, that's the total startup time. You've got this, yeah, right. Okay. So with one thread, you know, it takes over a minute to start up, and then you know, you can see the times fall. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we're starting up a VM faster. Right, but so the idea here is you you have the one VM you're starting up, and that one VM starts up faster. Now, if you had 200 VMs you're having to start up, what's going to be the penalty you're going to take for it going and overflowing the number of CPUs you have on the system mm -hmm. um, due to all the parallelization that was added? Right, so one of the things that KTAS does is it prevents this overly optimistic sort of flooding the system with threads. We really don't want to do that. So in addition to running them at lower priority, we also have caps on the number of threads that run per node as well as on the entire system. Okay. I'm sorry, but you are talking about a single task. What if uh, this task is uh, issuing transactional instructions to the CPU? What if you are actually splitting this transaction? Not too um, up on that area, but I would imagine it would be a thing that we would point out and just say, be careful if you're using it for this, you know. Just repeat for the audio. So, so the client calling the framework knows how to break up the work. They know whether it's safe to break up the chunk. They know whether a chunk is atomic or not and can't be broken up. So it's purely a uh, decision on the client. Uh, Daniel, sorry. How are we on Can time, you? Pasha? Uh, I have a question, Daniel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sorry. Here I have a question. Quickly, can you go over what the construct might be if I were to use, I if I know ahead of time, let's say, uh, I have a lot of uh, inter CPU intensive work to be done in the kernel, what would be the construct of such a, uh, 
how would I request for this? Is this an API? Would I specify the number of threads? Uh, and what are the criteria I should consider in an ideal situation for such a usage? Right, so you, you know, it's a new API. You pass in a few parameters that explain, you know, the size of the task, where it starts, the um, thread function. And critically, there are a couple other parameters that I was hoping to talk about, although I'm all out of time. Um, the um, minimum chunk size is very important. It, it, it describes the minimum amount of work that makes sense for one thread to do. Mm. So if you're operating on a large um, range of memory, say 128 megabytes would be your chunk size rather than something like one megabyte so that you wouldn't start umpteen threads to operate on these tiny ranges. Uh, Danny, um, so you, is it uh, new malware? I mean, you can have tasks which sort of are new malware sensitive, so can the API take, you know, which new malware those tasks should run on? Yeah, the, there are two APIs, and one will allow you to do that. You can, okay. you can say which parts of the task run on which nodes. Was this, uh, is this specific to one type of cluster, for example, ARM has different speed CPUs? And it's, uh, it's not aware of the hardware layout specifically, no. no. Okay. So basically the programmer, or the, the kernel developer has to be aware of what, what you're running. And is there, would it be useful, what I'm saying is, would it be useful to give that option as well? Maybe provide CPU masks for these parallelized threads to run on? Yeah, that is one possible extension, sure. If you wanted uh, to be more specific about where things ran, then just which node, you know, sure. I think this is the last question. I don't want to run over too much. Okay. Um, I, I think basically um, the, the current unique code already do some parallel initialization of memory, but what just one thread per node. So uh, are you going to change the, the, the way it works? Instead of um, doing that, uh, you spawn the, the K task to do all the in initialization? Sorry, I missed the beginning, but you're talking about struct pages, right? It's struct page, yeah. Structure page in initialization is already currently done in parallel, but one thread per node. Yes, so I actually do build on top of that. Um, uh -huh. I don't change what Mel added because KTAS requires you to describe the work up front, and so you would have to traverse all of the ranges beforehand in order to be able to describe it to the API. If you just ran each, each thread in a node like we do now, then you don't have to do that. You can just start the KTAS right off. I have a last question. Oh, uh, very last very, question. Very, very <laughs> short one. Uh, so, so I read the, the, the RFC documentation, and it says that it is for a CPU intensive work. Is that the only intent, or can it be used for I/O intensive or a high latency I/O work that we might want to do for storage in kernel? Can it be replacement for work used to start moving to K work, or yet to be thought? You know, honestly, I I haven't thought about that at all, but it is one possible extension. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, yeah, hello, hello folks. 
Uh, I'm Yang Shi from uh, Alibaba. I'm going to talk about something about uh, MFSI. Yeah, uh, firstly, I'm going to uh, uh, speak what's the problems about uh, MFSM. I think uh, everybody knows about uh, what uh, MFSM is uh, doing, is uh, protecting the address space of the process. But the abuse of the and the misuse of the MFSM may lead to some uh, process are stalled for a very long time. The process may um, get stuck, and we see the hung and uh, something else. And uh, we it may uh, cause the I.O. priority inversion because uh, the pitfall may do the I.O. when uh, holding the MFSI and uh, some uh, the low contention between the multi-thread process, multi-thread tasks. Uh, in the uh, past year, we uh, in the community, we have uh, done some uh, work to mitigate the issue of the MFSI. Uh, we can, uh, we have uh, done the we have done the below. Uh, we have done something and uh, something are going on. Uh, first is that we can use uh, for some scenario we can use try lock to uh, to avoid the the sleep on the MF set for uh, some use case. For example, the KHBD because the KHBD uh, will scan all the uh, memory address space list to try to collapse a uh, THP. But it has uh, not to wait for the. Uh, but it has not to wait for the specific process. It can uh, skip the, block the process, and uh, the other uh, mitigation is there to, uh, downgrade the MFSM from a write to read in the, MMMap and the uh, BRK and memory map when, it uh, when they are shrinking the very large mapping, to uh to let the other uh, thread to uh, come in uh, in parallel. And uh, we have uh, something else uh, ongoing. Uh, the first one is a speculative page fault from uh, Lauren, but it's, uh, uh, the patch are still uh, reviewing. And it uh, tries to avoid holding the MFSM in the page fault pass. And the other one is uh, drop the MFSM when the doing IO in the page fault pass from uh, Joseph. Uh, this patch is uh, aimed to uh, why the I/O priority inversion? And actually, uh, on the list, uh, there is uh, one thing. I think there is uh, one one thing missing for the is in the swipe swipe pass. Uh, when doing a swipe, uh, the swipe will try to read ahead some uh, page thin. But uh, in this pass, there is not. Uh, uh, we have not uh, do anything in this pass to avoid the MMSM uh, to to avoid the holding MMSM long time. So I'm uh, uh, looking into that. And uh, actually, uh, all the approaches on the ways on the patches are trying to mitigate the problem. But there is uh, more fundamental issues in the MMSM. Uh, the I think the most important problem is that uh, well it's not easy to figure out what MMSM really protects, because uh, we use MMSM to protect uh, like the VMA arbitrary, and the VMA list, and the VMA flex, and the even worse that we have to hold the ex exclusive lock for updating the VMA flags and uh, some uh, fields in the MM track. You can see uh, we used to use MMSM to synchronize the access to Arcstar and, and uh, something in the MM struct. But this had been uh, dropped in the 4.8. We introduced a dedicated lock for, for this stuff. So uh, I actually I don't have a, a specific idea about how to solve the fundamental issue. So I would like to, uh, you know, bring the bring uh, bring the problem to the broader broader audience to see uh, anyone else has a better idea. So uh, we may use the, some uh, finer green uh, lock, for example, a uh, range lock on um, per uh, VMA lock to. Uh, to kill the MMSM, finally. So. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Can you do mic, please? The per VMA lock thing has been suggested before in the past, but uh, most people agree that it would just um, transition the MFSM into that. The, the contention wouldn't vary that much, 
um, particularly when you're mainly doing operations on the same VMA. So it, you, you'd be replacing one point of contention for another. Or what? For the per VMA lock thing, you'd be replacing one point of contention uh -huh. with another. Uh, no, I didn't try that. <laughs> no, I'm actually talking about the, the per VMA lock. Um, but uh, it, if you're working with just one VMA, of course, yeah. The, the, rain, the range locking um, will, will still help, but there are races right now with when you're dealing with a single VMA. So could it, we you can all oh I'm sorry go ahead could we perhaps start splitting VMAs even though if they have the same flags and stuff just to avoid the contention like of some maximum VMA size VMA, VMA size and then we split it more <laughs> that would actually help because a lot of times when you have a program that has a gigantic VMA where most accesses happen, you don't know that the different threads will just be accessing stuff randomly all over. And simply splitting up uh, the VMA into more might not actually help you. Uh, yeah, it's true. Actually, for some applications, we may have a very gigantic VMA and uh, some workload may have a very a lot of uh, very small VMAs, so the, well, actually I'm not sure the if uh, how much the range lock on pro uh, can benefit for different workloads. So if uh, for um, maybe um, for the applications with uh, very, uh, a lot of uh, very small VMA, it may uh, benefit a lot, but for uh, with a very gigantic VMA, it may, may not get any benefit from the range lock. I think this uh, argue in the uh, in the community too. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I I would just like to add that um, downgrading a white lock to a red lock may not have may depend on the workload may not actually have um, the bond benefit. Reason is because we do a white lock optimistic spinning, but when it become a weed lock. Uh, all the spinning writer will will have to sleep. Uh, yeah, actually, I saw that uh, <laughs> a regression report. Yeah, when you are down right, uh, down right the red lock from red lock, it may uh, break something for if you enable the uh, WSM spinning on uh, owner. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, but it is still uh, it still can get benefited for some uh, use case if there yeah, are yeah, a lot yeah. of uh, writers so waiting on the. I but not so a lot of readers waiting on the MSM. No, yeah, there's no no writer inside the yeah, readers. Yeah, it will depend yeah. on exactly the depends, yeah. how much writer and reader you have. Yes. Yeah, that that mainly looks bad in, in micro benchmarks. But yeah, if you have a a case where you can really benefit from from sharing the lock, then yeah, that definitely. Oh uh, yeah, I know it's a yeah, it's a actually a micro benchmark, but uh, it may have not a significant impact on real life workload. Um, one, one, one of the things with, um, we're, we're looking at, uh, if, if you were here earlier, we were talking about adding an RCU safe B tree. We're actually looking at replacing this R B tree with that RCU safe B tree once, once it exists. So we, we, we may be able to get the uh, contention on that uh, RW sem down a bit by just not even taking the, the semaphore to read. We'll see if this works out. I don't know. <laughs> we've, uh, people have been trying a lot of different things over the years, and, and maybe this one will work, and maybe not. Who knows? But we're going to try. Yeah. Th th so, oh, sorry. Was there more? I'll go with it. Yeah. Uh, so the problem with the range lock is generally you've got some kind of tree of structures you're traversing to see if a range is already there or not, and you've got to lock the root, and that's still your bottleneck. Um, an alternate approach is to use something like a hashed array of locks uh, to cover the VMA range. Um, that wraps around. So, um, y you know, and, and you need a lot of buckets, depending on you have the number of buckets roughly scale with the size of the VMA. But if you want to touch a certain range, you, you know, you hash the appropriate range, you take that lock, you release it, 
and that's very parallelizable. Um, the one disadvantage of that approach is that if you have to do something on a fairly large range, you might have to uh, lock a series of buckets. So that, that's the downside. But in practice, I've seen that work well. Uh, yeah, I agree. Actually, there's always a trade-off between the, you know, you yeah, so, a range lock. so we actually have a, a range lock already. It's based on our B tree. Um, and performance-wise, like when you compare it to the worst case scenario with what we have with the uh, read-write semaphores, um, it actually perform out semaphores will, will always outperform it because it has the spinning thing, um, but it's actually pretty close to the worst case scenario. So as a baseline for a starting, for the primitive itself, I think we're in a good place right now. Um, the, the main pain point right now I see with range locking is how do you um, serialize operations, concurrent operations on the same VMA? Using the, the RCU for projecting the arbitrary, like Mathieu is mentioning, that could be a, an idea. But at once we, we've done that, there is also the VMA list. There is also the anon VMA that's pointing to the VMA that's will making some issues there. The problem that with the VMA is that there is so many uh, ways to get to the VMA. There is the uh, the arbitrary, there is the VMA list, but there is the anon VMA also, and. That's making the problem more complex. That's only one list, and range locking is one option. But when we are getting to the VMA, to the unknown VMA, what about the range locking there? At the point. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you, Laurent. <laughs> and um, what, one, one, one of the things that we don't distinguish really in our code base at the moment is are we protecting an individual VMA? by having this lock? Or are we protecting the whole address space? And I think once we split that, th th those locking assumptions apart, I think we will have a better time trying to scale than we are right now. Yeah, and we have to get to the per VMA lock. Uh, I, 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 think, I think we're going to need one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's main also that, 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 that going to the point that should we have to uh, merge VMA, split VMA, all the stuff we are doing through the VMA just to have this VMA list the smallest is possible. And that's also leading to some log contention because if we have multiple VMA and per VMA log, we are easier to get this. But also when we will try to unmap a large uh, range of area that's covering multiple VMA, we will have to find a way to be sure that we are not engaging to some Situation because some of those threads will try to get some locking that's on this area also, and we'll get some trouble there. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what I'm really hoping to get to is having a spin lock that's protecting the entire process's address space, and then having the, the, the a semaphore for each VMA. But I don't know if we'll get there. Yeah, but that is still the deadlock situation when addressing multiple VMA at one time. Um. I think there's a way around it, but we, we, sh we, should, we should probably talk with the whiteboard in front of us to yeah, figure okay. out what we're, that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Problem will go through. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you.